All right, guys. It's Kevin Brittingham, Live, Cure, Die podcast. Today, we're sitting down with an old friend, John Clements. He's a proof research right now. John and I go back, and with Ethan, about 20 years. John is an unsung hero of our industry and a great asset in the support side of U.S. Special Operations. Uh, we're going to talk about him growing up in Indiana near Crane, the Surface Warfare Center, going to work there, supporting the Navy shooting team, and then moving to Damneck to Virginia Beach to support the guys that are shooting people in the face that deserve it. This episode of the Live, Cue, or Die podcast is brought to you by the cool motherfuckers over at Tactical Distributors. What do you need? They got it. Jackets, shirts, belts, you know, masks. Put in the promo code UNPOSSIBLE15. That is UNPOSSIBLE15. Gets you 15% off your entire order. Get to it. TacticalDistributors.com. Hey, we're here with our buddy John Clements. Yep, new friend. Hey, hey, John. Guys. Well, yeah. he's good to be old here. friend. New, new to friend, you, new friend to me. Good yeah. to see you, but we'll see if he's a friend yeah, to you. That's old. true. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we've got a good start. I think we're <laughs> yeah. Well, John, how, how long have we known one another? You think? Oh, oh my. Um, it was before the four sixteen suppressor thing, so this goes back two thousand, two thousand one. I would say. I was guessing about twenty years. Yeah. You know, I remember around uh, that was probably pre 9 11 we were at a some military government event i don't even remember and i'm sitting with my old buddy trey knight he's like hey you know that guy <laughs> i said no who is it he says yeah it's john clements he's like that's a dude you need to know that guy <laughs> and that's what he said to me and i was like oh, oh, john oh clements. wow man i gotta buy him some beer uh, yeah <laughs> and i didn't it, know that i'm 20 years late paying him off for that yeah, yeah. Well, then, and he told me y y you know what you did uh, and um and that was probably a year before i ever met you or, or dealt with you but i remember him saying that we were sitting down you walked by with some of your guys um <laughs> you know so yeah, just move that thing around if you need to i, I yeah. fidget with it right all on. the time um so, yeah, it's about 20 years. Yeah. And how long you known Ethan, you think? Uh, when we started in the AAC project for Blackouts, when I met Ethan down, okay. down your way. So, as I time. recall, right. Yeah, so beginning of Blackout. Yeah. Um, well, I don't even really know how to, to do this introduction. I want to get into several things. Uh, your background, y y your time serving um, the guys in the military and then what you're doing now with proof research right but i want to pick out lots of stories because you just ended up in a very unique position and i think affected change and a lot of awesome stuff for a lot of the guys that really in the mix and you know i think for ethan and i and and our old company advanced armament um you know one thing that's come become incredibly prolific we would have never done without you asking is 300 blackout and i tell my version of the story all the time but i think it's best to uh, so that's like the first story i want to get into but um why don't we just start with your background and yeah and what you did before proof yeah well uh, so your kid getting out of high school what do you do yeah you know i, I really don't know exactly what i want to do but um you know i always like to do things with my hands i was a muscle car guy doing a lot of drag racing and beer drinking and country roads down in Nowhere, southern Indiana, just about uh, 20 miles south of the of the Crane Base is where I grew up in a little town called Lagodi, Indiana. Lagodi? Yeah. So for those that don't know, Crane, Crane Surface Warfare Center is a naval facility mm -hmm. that was established, what, in World War II? Yeah, it was, it was commissioned in 1941 as NAD Crane, Naval Ammunition Depot Crane. So the, the idea was to build munitions there, and it's in the center of the country, so it'd be hard for the Germans or the really Japanese. Naturally to camouflaged in the, in the rolling hills of Martin County, and it touches Greene County and, and uh, a couple of the other neighboring counties, but it takes up about 35% of the Martin County, Indiana, where I grew up. So 64,000 acres, right? 64,000. Okay, still so that's what, yeah, still yeah. big. <laughs> yeah. So it's about as far as you can get from the ocean, but it's a naval facility. It is. 
Yeah. Ooh. Okay. And Makes it's strictly designed to, <laughs> to, to manufacture ordnance, bombs, ammunition, uh, anything that supported the war effort back from World War II through Korea, through Vietnam, and, and onward. And it's, uh, it's sort of transitioned into what they call um, a center of excellence for acquisition, technology, testing, and, and things like that. But they still do. Um, the, so, ar- the Army came in and did um, took over all of the ammunition and ordnance manufacturing, storage, and logistics. Yeah. And that's where I started on the Army side in, in ordnance uh, manufacturing, working in just a machine shop as a, as a young machinist back in 1983. And just because you happened to grow up there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, people ask me all the time, like I was telling you, I go, how do you get in it? It's like, ah, it just kind of happens and keep working on it. Yeah, it was, it was, it was luck and happenstance. You know, I was out of a job. I, you know, I, um, I quit dabble in industry after college. In 1982, uh, everything shut down. People got laid off. I came back home, was working in a little print shop with my dad and uh, a buddy of mine who was uh, interning there from Purdue University. We went to high school together and brought me an application for a machinist. I filled it out, made the cert. A few months, uh, a few weeks later, got a call and um, actually was hired in on my on my birthday that that we share, the 13th of January, yeah. 1983. So, and that kicked it off. That's your first day. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, so what happens? Like, like what, what's the, the, the quick story of yeah. you, you're, you're a machinist there doing, doing everything whatever. for making special tools, jigs, fixtures, and special machinery for, uh, supporting all of the ordnance manufacturing that was going on, on the base. And, yeah. uh, uh, I was actually hired in as a, on a temporary status people that are in DOD uh, civil service understand that. And then it took me about 22 months to get the opportunity to reach over into a career conditional job, which was a slot that happened to open up um, in my dream of a lifetime, basically. Targeted job was being uh, the precision metal guy, as I describe it, um, working for the Navy marksmanship program in the the match shop. So I, I started doing all of the critical modifications and fabrication and you know accuracy improvement processes and everything you would throw at an m1 grand an m14 a, a 1911 m1 grand back yeah. then oh yeah yeah oh my and god that's what the navy marksmanship program so m14 m1 grand and what was the other one uh 1911s and then we had all the high standards you know for all the various disciplines of competition uh throughout the inner service uh so no m16s back then shooting. they weren't shooting that in competition no we were doing Early days, welding lugs on the M14s and doing double lug, you know, sinking them down and bedding them and screwing yeah. them. Yeah, so they made you, so you become essentially like a, a fancy gunsmith for the Navy right. marksmanship team. Right, I mean, I took my metal, precision metal stuff and my training as a tool and die maker through my little two-year program and from Vincennes University. Um, and then just rolled that into, you know, the gun side of uh, where I ended up and, and kind of took off from there. And uh Always had an, an affection for shooting and hunting, and guns intrigued me. And um, as I mentioned to you yesterday, my grandfather worked for Winchester back from the 20s up to the time the war started, and he was a big trap shooter and a big uh, inspiration in, in my life. And uh, that's, that's awesome. sort of where the where the firearms uh, intrigue and and um, yeah, the interest came from. Yeah, he, to he push said on. his so his grandfather was one of you, you know like. The golden age of guns, as I like to call it, like kind of between the 20s and 50s where they'd travel around and do demos, like, you, you know, mm-hmm. the, the demos of like, what do you call it, like trick shooting and fancy shooting with a shotgun. Yeah, and that was his that job. a great job. Yeah. Like breaking targets with 300 blackout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did the greatest demo of the 20th century. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's that's, that's, that's a good story to, when we get into 300 blackouts. Yeah. Too. So anyway, that's sort of my my pedigree on my interest for, for guns and shooting and everything, uh, you know, sort of in that lane and took off with, uh, I spent, oh my, we got there in 1984 and, uh, progressed out of the, sort of the mat shop. We built a whole new prototype development, um, facility there that expanded into doing what other prototype fabrication for other, you know, other than weapons, and then oh, other than weapons. I was going to say, yeah. you know, sometimes that's what it takes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're just a, a young punk. You, you're a machinist. You start supporting the shooting team, but it takes somebody with the passion and the drive, and where it's not a job, 
you know, it's a lifestyle. It's not, it's not, you're not there for a paycheck. And, and and sometimes that's what it takes to, to grow that to something else to where you start developing product you start working with with industry to develop product for the guys that are shooting that's true and, and you got to have you got to have vision you got to have passion for it because it doesn't work if you don't have either one of those and yeah if you're um, just sitting there thinking oh what am i going to get out of this sit back and wait on someone job. to put you to work then it's it's, it's going to be shitty you know and yeah. i reached out and tried to tried to carve my own way and and you know leave from the front i'm then uh and we did a lot of other things doing you know aerospace uh program support for a couple of programs that were on the other side of the base and then we were still doing all the navy shooting team stuff we just had a whole brand new shop with all new equipment had to brought in a couple of guys to work with me uh and was growing the shop and the capability yeah and uh it was just called uh, the prototype shop and then um eventually it rolled into um developing a relationship uh with the guys at damneck and then doing all their precision rifle stuff and their sniper stuff and uh in the confines of what we call the SPM program, the Special Purpose Munitions, which so, is all the non-standard uh, ammunition and weapons modifications that went along with supporting uh, development group back in those early days. The, yeah, so Dev Group. So for my, right. most a lot of people listening won't know Damn Neck. So Virginia Beach, and right. that's the East Coast where the seals. Right. Yeah. yeah we often of refer refer to those guys as uh, you know Dev Group or you know. The, com- yeah. the command, the compound, but uh, uh, yeah. So it, it's neck is a pretty gen- general way to describe general where, way. Where you so yeah. most people think of like um, I think from a um, you know a basic or commercial civilian perspective, it's like the Navy SEALs. Where there are the Navy SEALs, yeah. it's just like then there's the, uh, an elite group within there, and a lot of those guys are, are ones that have been on. Um, you know, that do the special stuff. So when there's weapons yeah, they're, they're, stuff developed. They're obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's no secret. It's been all over the news and everybody else has talked about it. But uh, they're a tier one SMU, you know, just yeah. like the other guys through. And, uh, yeah, I think a lot of people don't understand. It's, you know, and I learned this too with the Army Marksmanship Unit, which was mm-hmm. sort of the cousin of what you were doing. Exactly. And, uh, you know, they develop a lot of, you know, they get the best shooters in the world. They recruit them. They're mm-hmm. professional shooters. They're there. They're supported by guys like you who are building the guns, helping right. them to make the guns more accurate, helping them to be the best they can. And there is a huge overlap in that. And then the guys at the most elite level, every advantage they can get, whether yeah. it be gun, equipment, you know, training. Um, and they end up training a lot of those guys or, or working with them. And a lot of the, sure the stuff that guys like you would develop overlaps into those organizations where they're not bound to like big army guns. Right. Or big army, you know, equipment in general, whether it be uniforms, thermal, right. like a lot of the, the the soldier stuff, individual soldier. Um, so you start supporting that mm-hmm. um, from Crane in Indiana, and they're half a country away in Virginia Beach. Yeah, you know, and, and um, I started making several trips down to see the guys, and specifically working with uh, the sniper guys they called Black Team back in the day, and. Uh, uh, was able to do some good things um, and uh, develop a reputation of trust, which was you know near and dear to me, and I was yeah. fortunate enough to be able to maintain that as as time went on. Uh, but it was it was never considered work. It was so much fun working with those guys, and I thought it was so, it was so cool I could pick up the phone and call these guys right into Naval Special Warfare Development Group, and they pick up the phone and talk to me. Yeah, uh, and, uh, so Dev Group is, is that kind of how the name like development group because they're developing new yeah they capabilities through, you know the, the obviously back in the Marcinko days it was uh, you know mob six then it was seal team six and then they changed it into uh, naval special warfare development group was uh the vanilla title for what we did as a as an r&d facility for all of the capabilities from it's not offensive from from guns to parachutes to diving to you know so and it was uh yeah. We kind of were designed, I say we, the command was designed to set up to develop advanced tactics and equipment uh, to support extraneous mission sets that we would transition down to um, what we call the white side or the tier two. Yeah, so white side will mean just like the general Navy SEALs. Right. Um, so kind of like, that's not degrading really, that's just sort of an internal term that we use to, you know, to distinguish the, you know, the, the two different units and what and where they do there's lots of overlap we had lots of augmentation guys that would come on and help with uh various things along the way throughout the years so 
Well, from my standpoint, being an industry person who has worked with all the groups, it's so fascinating to me that everything that the Navy side has to cover, like just the mobility and the ships and that sort of training and the diving and all that. It's big. Yeah, it's it's a whole nother, you know, like some of your cousins, it, it's, it's way more simplistic. Mm-hmm. Like you got, okay, you get on planes sometimes, you're in, you're in vehicles on land sometimes, you shoot. <laughs> you know, these yeah. sorts of, I mean, I'm obviously simplifying it. But when you throw the water in there and the diving and, and the ships and all that sort of mobility, oh, my God. Yeah. That's, the, the, the maritime mission um, was something pretty tough because you've got a lot of things to consider when it comes to uh, yeah. all your equipment. You know? I would say. It's got to yeah. work in the water. It's got to work coming across the beach. It's got to work when you get there. You know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, well, Ethan, you know, is an engineer in the industry developing the guns. And when it comes to some of that, you got corrosion, like just a whole different set of standards. Yeah, salt fog stuff. <laughs> yeah, oh, what a bitch. The salt fog testing mm-hmm. for you guys. Oh, it makes you want to kick a puppy. Yeah, I remember doing the, the very first 416s in the 96-hour 10% salt fog at Crane in the tank. and um, That's tough. You know, they passed it, and they did okay. But uh, that, that, was a, that was a big screen out for um, – certain components that they're required to go through that environmental oh, test. That'll, it, that'll ruin most guns. It like will. 24 hours yeah. on, 24 hours off. Oh, it, yeah. You yeah. know, I, I think this is an interesting point because I want to segue here to a couple things. Your move from Crane to moving to Virginia Beach mm-hmm. to directly support command. But also, when we talk about, like I know you have a big affinity for Night Force scopes. I like Night Force scopes. They're great. Yeah. I, like, you know, we've worked with those guys since the, well, for what, uh, to back up a little bit on that, it seemed to me, as I recall, back in the early 2000s, Loophole decided to get away from doing anything tactical. They chased Walmart. You're exactly right. And uh, they wanted to go with the commercial, the hunting lane of, of optics. And uh, yeah. and that's when uh, a good friend of mine, Art Rome, bless his soul, he passed away. But uh, he he and Jeff Huber, Huber, excuse me, we're really good friends, and he he got in in uh, got the command to run him with uh, some of the early night force stuff, and um, you know the rest is sort of history. And that was in two thousand one. Yeah. yeah. But when people ask me, because you know, like early in my career, in my career kind of went backwards, and you know, I pretty much start out my career working with, you know, like this level, and but understanding the requirements. You know, I, I love Night Force Optics. I just got one of their one to eights. I'm gonna, I've got on a little mini fix. Um, but now, for most of my use, like I understand, okay, what's my use? You know, and I think Ethan and his guys have been great at this because every time I ask them to do something, what's the requirement? What are you wanting to do? Like yeah. I gotta, like, you know, they hold me accountable, and I gotta make a priority list. And if you don't, and it's the it's the right thing to do because you end up with some shit you don't want. Right. But when it comes to like your guys. And like Jay, you being one of those goofy cloners, it builds all the, <laughs> the you know Mark thirteen or the Mark eighteen or all the military guns. It's like in realizing over time, dealing with the engineers, dealing with guys like yourself, and dealing with the guys like okay, well shit, night force that scope's heavy because it needs to be able to survive this impact or this salt fog shit. Like okay, I'm going hunting in New Zealand for two weeks. I don't need the extra stuff expense weight mm-hmm. all the things that come with being able to survive these requirements which you know and with time it makes me understand uh, optics or coatings on guns or materials the requirements for you guys even opposed to your very close cousins that are in you know different branches of the military yeah. their requirements and and why sometimes it can be different um, I love night force optics some of their stuff though it's too heavy I don't use it right. and and that's because you know, it, and I know being on the inside like you, it was designed for this requirement for this group, and they take their shit in submarines or on ships, or right. there's a the potential that you need this kind of, um, you know, durability or corrosion pr- protection and all these sorts of things that I never need. Right. right. And it adds a shitload of cost, a shitload of engineering time, a lot more testing, you know, and it, you know, it's still breakable. It's still breakable. Yeah, yeah, you can break anything. We all know that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So uh, you got to get everything, (laughs) everything. (laughs) All those things considered, we tried to, you know, 
design all of the critical performance uh, components up front and test them to the best we could for, you know, the mission. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, I mean, and with the organization that you supported over time, the mission varies so much. You have – there's so much latitude in what it can yeah. be there that – there is, uh, like, I, I think they need a bigger toolbox than some of the or other organizations because, you know, like high-profile things, um, like uh, a Captain Phillips or whatever, right. something that took place in the ocean. Right. Y you know, you got equipment for that, and then there's stuff that takes place in the middle of Pakistan right. in the desert. Right. Different requirements. W when did you make the, 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 well, I don't know. I even want to back up. All right, so once you get there, like what's what are some of the first projects once the shop grew that you worked on small arms wise yeah i transitioned down there um just to back up a little bit more and in 1997 um i had been able to get a bigger part in the spm program from the crane side from the support side and they had semi-annual meetings at crane to discuss priorities and budgets and things like that and one of the guys that uh, I worked with uh, coherently when I got down there was an ordinance manager that ran all the ammo stuff. And uh, this position that I was able to take a, a bit later uh, had come open. And uh, this was around Christmas in 1997. And I said, uh, hey, Don. Don Dietrich was his name. He's passed away. And uh, he, was, he was a great asset to the command. And um, uh, But uh, I said, hey, is that position still open? And he looked at me and said, uh, this is after about eight beers at the VFW in Crane Village, Indiana. So... <laughs> He, uh, he, goes, yeah. he goes, yeah, you want it? I said, well, yeah, maybe. Maybe I'm ready now. <laughs> my, my oldest daughter. You're was, like a dog that caught the car. Huh? Well, you know, I, I, the, the reason I couldn't take it a year earlier is because my daughter was, uh, my oldest daughter was going to be a senior in high school, and that was not a good move for me to be pulling her out and going to Virginia Beach and making her graduate from someplace she didn't know. So yeah. we, we, we stayed home, stayed at Crane until, uh, you know, 97 started having the conversation in late 97 and by uh by july of 98 i was i was living uh in virginia beach and uh got transitioned down there and everything set up so took over the shop there and i uh, had a couple of good guys working with me there jonathan king he's a relic and uh and uh, a namesake <laughs> to the to the to the command of the That's community you, you're becoming a relic <laughs> <laughs> you've been around so long I, you're I, a relic i can't go through this without mentioning john king he's a great friend and uh and uh, a good colleague, and we had some good times together, a lot of them interesting. But I uh, uh, worked with him, and I think one of the early things we did was uh, Warrant Officer Johnson, Wojo, it was his um, um, sort of his handle. He uh, uh, was running Black Team, the Sniper Shack, but that was sort of the, the, the concentrated control or the manager for what I referred to earlier as the SBM program. And those guys were kind of leading the way with the special project stuff. And uh, we wanted to build short barrel carbines. And um, I was not an AR guy at the time. I was pretty much a precision bolt gun, you know, cut my teeth so that's on what, Yeah, that's and, where you started out. Yeah, I was doing, uh, was same, doing sniper rifles and then this whole gas gun thing. It's the same out. thing, you know, with Johnny yeah. Noveski. Yeah. And the Army gets out. He get, he learns to make barrels at Pacnor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the first five years of his business, he was building precision bolt guns. That's what he was yeah. into and dabbled Very in similar. ARs. And now, you know, Noveski's known as an AJ, as you know, yep. AR company. But his love was precision stuff in, in the beginning and building. Same thing. Yeah, because we, we wanted to make a, a ten and a half inch barrel, you know, M4. And uh, so this became the Mark 18. It did. Was it? it was a predecessor to the Mark 18. We built 30 of them that we implemented into Blue Team at the time because we had to make sure this thing would run with this crappy old training ammo, this old frangible called Rota. It was, I don't uh, even know it. Um, it was a polymer copper projectile. It was just terrible stuff, but it was their training round that they used in, in their kill house for their CQB training. It, well, why did it need to work with that just for their training? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, obviously to, you know, to practice and to train the way they would, they would fight, then, um, uh, this ammunition was a key component to, to making it run in these short guns. And, uh, 
I really didn't know what I was doing. I made several calls to Doug Olson down at nights. And yeah, Doug, I, great engineer. I, Doug, Doug, um, Doug was one of the engineers for Qualitech back when, um, mm-hmm. yeah, Dev Group was stood up when yeah. Marcinko was in charge. Yeah. So for those that don't know, like the Red Cell books and all that stuff, yeah. Dick Marcinko um, was yeah. in charge in the beginning, and Doug Olson developed a lot of stuff for those guys. But Doug Olson actually started at Crane. That's right. Yeah. yeah, he started at Crane yeah, so, as well. So we kind of shared an alma mater there. Yeah, and so then he that. became the engineer, like went through a couple things yeah. after after the uh, – Worked for Mickey Finn, stuff. built those suppressors. Mickey for the, Finn for at those, Qualitech. For those, uh, for those Smith & Wesson pistols for Marcinko back in the early days. Smith & Wesson's and yeah. then the P9S silencers yeah. and MP5 silencers and the 22. Mm-hmm. And then he went to AWC with everything they had developed there. And uh, then at Knight's Armament, and, and, and he did the, uh, what do you call their, what do you call their, call their silencer? The Knight's Armament 556 silencer. The NT4. NT, that, that's okay. So the NT4. The Whisper uh, Pickle Corn Cob. <laughs> <laughs> Whisper Pickle. So, like yeah, and he, I mean, he did all of it. Um, the the SAS, so the M110, yep. the Mark 11 silencer. What was and the little six millimeter? Um, uh, the PDW. P- PDW so he and Marvin. For, for yeah. He and Marvin, Marvin, Marvin did that. Right. And uh, so the Knights PDW, we should throw so that up cool, on the screen yeah. now. So cool. So we'll probably even have a picture of Aiden shooting it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then um, uh, the Mark 23 pistol. Yeah. So oh, Doug. That's w- the compact, super light. Mark 23, right? Mm-hmm. No, super, I think you're super, thinking super of something small, else. <laughs> super small, not heavy at all. But yeah. Doug did the sign. Oh, I meant to go get that book. That was the thing I get. I'll, I'll go get it and bring it in here. So uh, Knights was originally on the Mark 23 program, which was called the uh, offensive handgun at the it time. It was very offensive. I was just yeah, saying, was Ethan was offended by it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, Most everybody was. Yeah. yeah. So it was a snap-on can that went on a Colt. Uh, we'll put a picture up. I'll take a picture out of some stuff I've got. Um, put it on the screen right here. Uh, so they were working with Colt because Reed had a relationship with Colt and they did a snap on can. The can was great, but the HK pistol won the Mark 23 contract and had a German silencer on it. That was kind of shit. And it was I, kind of a boxy shaped. It wasn't, it wasn't round. Yeah, it was yeah. sort of matched the profile of the slide as I recall. Original yeah. black box. So in it, in it, as I know, it was a rectangular silencer, but it was round K baffles, had a wipe in the end. It was just volume below, but it's mm-hmm. loud as shit. So mm-hmm. Doug's silencer that he did with the crimp cone baffles, we can also put a picture up, was um, on the Colt gun. And the Colt silencer was really quiet, but the Colt gun didn't win, the HK gun win. So so come from my perspective, you can probably correct me because I think it was the first thing you were involved in. They got him to switch and put uh, Knights to work with H&K and build the Mark 23 silencer that you cloners know of. Right. And that goes way back. That yeah. goes back to my, the late 80s, 1988 and 89, when uh, that solicitation came out. And I was at Crane at the time and was actually asked to be part of uh, one of the teams to evaluate the proposal for the suppressors. You yeah. Know? I mean, a little so bit out, I felt a little bit out of my, out of my league back then, but... We all got sequestered. Who doesn't? In in the in the BOQ at Crane and read all these documents and had to score them and uh, and uh, I learned a lot about all that kind of stuff. But it's between those two pistols, at the, when the final, um, you know, decision came, which guns they were going to test. So yeah, yeah. but uh, you yeah, remember the, that Ethan? You like that gun? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Well, the, you, start, you don't like the requirement, or you well, don't like the gun. The gun meets the requirement. When you write requirements that are really, really tough, you end up with guns that may not oh, be yeah. acceptable. Like yeah, thirty thousand rounds of plus P plus forty five. Yeah. I mean, just with, swap with, the I, gun I, out. I, I can't remember what the what the failure rate and what the stoppage uh, criteria was, but it was it was pretty difficult. And that's, yeah, so you end up with a four pound what, handgun. That's what drove like, that uh, F four fifty pistol. <laughs> you know, basically. Well, that Mark. Yeah, that's right. F four fifty. That I mean, that Mark twenty three. I actually love that gun from my perspective. It's big and stupid. I go to the range. The gun is so accurate. It shoots so nice. It even does with plus everything it's supposed to do. Yeah, but it's you might as well have an MP seven or a honey badger. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a requirement this high. The gun has to get up yeah, there. It's it's so weird because, you know, it's like I hate all the pistol stuff because it's so hard to shoot a pistol and people to be proficient with it. And, and you know, it's so personal because a pistol is something that's just like a pair of boots. You know, it's like, oh, oh this doesn't feel right. The, and I thought the safety and the selector controls on the on the Mark 23 um, were 
were way undersized and hard, 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 to, hard to access. Yeah, Gut especially rich. all the pitchers are like guys with gloves and yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, that gun, and you know, but you, you shoot it, it's great to shoot, then you're like, oh, but, like, what are you going to do with it? But for me, I just hate spending time and effort and energy on pistols in general but when we talk about military stuff because all the guys that you and the three of us know, and maybe you, Jay, I don't know, but um, <laughs> that in these groups that have, you know, actually shot a bunch of terrorists and stuff, like, nobody ever uses a gun. Uh, or a handgun, like a pistol, like it's just. Except for Mike why Day, would you? no, well, it was. I mean, there's a Mike film. Day. Lou <laughs> there, dancing there, around. Lou, <laughs> Lou did it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there, there were some times when you know some of those rooftop operations were critical when uh, the suppressed pistols came into yeah. being. Uh, so okay. funny, those guys still using pistols from 1979. They just rebuild the silencers and they just put a laser on them. No, so yeah. th- that's one thing. But just overall, the average like badass operator. You know, carrying a four sixteen or whatever, like ha- him having a pistol is like it's last ditch effort, worst case scenario. Well, I, I was always pretty vocal, just from a, a innocent support civilian bystander perspective. I thought, well, they go to Shaw's and they shoot and they do all these headplate stuff. They do transition drills, but they spend as much time shooting their pistols as they do their their primary on their rifle, which is is fine. But it seems like they spent so much time shooting pistols and well, headplates. I ask it too because yeah. you know I spent a lot of time at both, and I'm not judging the guys. That's what they do, and they love to do it. And shooting pistols, great and fun. You gotta, well, you gotta have the skills I, to do that kind of I thing. I question but. because I thought it was stupid. Because like in one organization that I worked in, I'm like, how many people shoot people with pistols? And they're like, we have like two guys that have, you know. And it's it, it's like what we talked about. Like there was, uh, and, and we've seen the, you know, there's like a failure with a rifle transition used a pistol. But um, what they said was, and it made a lot of sense to me, it is a pistol is so difficult, but all of your bad habits with a pistol, they translate to a rifle. So a, a rifle is very easy to shoot in comparison. So they trained a lot with a pistol because um, it made them much better rifle shooters. Okay. And, and, that's, and, that's... and it made sense because all the bad habits, because, you know, you're out there with a pistol, compo- you know, as opposed to buttstock and your cheek and... yeah. Um, and so that, cause I think every guy in that group shot like 50,000 rounds a year or mm-hmm. something with a, a, a handgun. And I, you know, and I would go with them sometimes and shoot and I was like, it makes no sense. And, and that's what they told me. And then it's like, okay, so ammo's cheaper. It's a shorter range. They can get it done quicker. And it, it's just all of your bad habits and laziness. Like you can't hide it on a target with a pistol. That's true. And so I was like, oh yeah, I would say the discipline's a little more, um, Critical, you know, to, yeah. to your to your skill sets. And yeah, I, I, I think of pistol I never like thought a, that the, it transitions that much. I, I hadn't heard that. So. Well, that that was oh. the claim this guy made, yeah. and and it made sense to me. But you know, because I I do think of pistol like uh, golf. Like you know, you can lay down with a rifle, and if I tell you everything, do everything for you, you can make a shot as good as I can make. If it, it, even being very right. novice, right? But with a handgun, it's like golf. Like you got to get out there and that's swing true. the club a little bit, or you're gonna suck. No, that's right. It just takes lead down the barrel. You got to practice that one. Yeah, I mean, I know Ethan. You is is like being a pistol engineer for so long and shooting so much. I mean, you get somebody new in there to help you. How long does it take them where they can shoot groups? Oh, you can suck real quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've been there. I think I'm still there. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I think pistol, it's like if you it's just, it, you know, you, you need to understand some fundamentals and basics. But then I just think you got to do it a lot. Like a rifle is not hard. Ross Sanders, I'll never forget, you know, John Shaw. And uh, spent a lot of time, a lot of years out there. Still do. Uh, great folks. Did a lot of great training. And uh, I gained a lot of experience. and They did pistol knowledge. training? Uh, at Shaw's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and Ross Sanders was their primary instructor out there for as long as I can remember back when I got to the command. And I'll never forget the sight, slack, squeeze, sight, slack, squeeze. I'd go to bed at night just saying those three words, you know, on how to how to bring that pistol up and uh, acquire the target. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, those guys are awesome. Yeah, good group. It's, yeah, it's tough. He's not here right now, but Adam can shoot his ass off with a pistol. Yeah, Adam Johnson. I mean, all the dudes that worked at SIG Academy, I mean, they shot all day, yeah. you know, yeah. and they had some good instructors. No, he got that from the test group. Like, when you oh, test at SIG, yeah. you have to shoot a lot. 
Yeah, I that's mean, a that's, real thing. That's <laughs> time on the trigger, man. You just can't. When it comes to a pistol, I just don't think you can. There's no substitute. Yeah, yeah. there isn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So Mark 23. So that ridiculous thing. So you're involved in that. Yeah. You know, we, uh, we get through it. HK gets the contract and I think we had a brief discussion last night over a cocktail or three that, um, um, you know, I get this call at three in the morning, uh, in Indiana, the guys from crane, the program guys are having a design review and meeting in Obendorf. And, um, my boss at the time, Chuck Zeller, uh, calls me and says, Hey, John, oh, what you Chuck. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, He's living a life now, retired, got a house down in the villages, and uh, he's got a golf cart community thing going, so he's doing fine. I'd rather kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, good but, for him. But any, anyway, he says, hey, John, go go back uh, in the armory and get pistol XX whatever number and uh, take 25 millimeters out of the middle of the slide and shorten the barrel. <laughs> It's like, well, that's a great idea. Hey, Chuck sounds this, like an asshole right yeah, now. No, but it's like, I was saying in the morning, and I'm like, he's calling, and they're probably already in the happy hour over there, and I'm like, okay, so I get to work the next morning, and we go find the gun. I take the gun apart, and no kidding, I just cut the slide down the middle, machine 25 It's millimeters. a Mark 23. It's a Mark 23. Hmm. And I build a little fixture so we can weld it back together and take it on the outside, take it on the inside, machine it all back down, keep it all straight, shorten the <laughs> barrel, and you've got – the Mark 23. This is stuff I'll this. say to Ethan. <laughs> hey, can you take <laughs> yeah, but, an inch and a half out of the middle of this? But it, t- it turned it into like the HK 45, which is like, man, this is really a nice pistol. Now. Well, the HK 45, <laughs> that's that's like, I think what all of the SEALs bought back, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, right? Is, yeah, is we, it, we brought the compact on board. The compact, uh, yeah. Yeah. Because I think we made like 2,500 silencers for right. the SEALs for those. That's things. right. Yeah. yeah, and I, I remember arguing with uh, a good friend of mine in gold. He, he uh, um, tragically was one of the guys on extortion. But uh, Tom Ratzliff, he was he oh. was a he was a big rooftop guy and loved doing that kind of stuff. And I said, "What can't you do with the two two six? With what you're doing, why do we need this forty five? And I was usually just a real proponent of doing good stuff and and replacing and upgrading and yeah. getting the guys the better answer. But you know when you're a foot away, does it matter if it's nine or 45? And, no, I just you know, need you know, less you know, ammo that goes slower. You know, so <laughs> anyhow, well, I remember we were having what that conversation. What was his answer? Uh, yeah, he just won 45, right? So. <laughs> yeah, he was from Texas. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, and for the, those listening, it, it's um, – so, so the colors are squadrons of a uh, particular – Yeah, they used to be teams, you know. It started out uh, when Marcinko stood the place up. It was, it was gold team. And blue team, I think. Gold was the, the plank owner, was the original assault team. And they were d- divided into boat crews back in the early days. And then blue shortly followed. And then um, and then red and then silver most recently during my time there. So, yeah. And then we've got uh, another group upstairs that uh, is a d- another color. Yeah. So, but uh, they do other stuff. Yeah, so that's the way they divide up. But, yeah, they just wanted 45. Yeah, because, I mean, that wasn't that many. Well, I guess it was at this point, probably 15 yeah. years ago. But, get the you know, the HK-45 and the compacts, we made silencers for them. Great gun. So that that's kind of the where that gun started was you just – I mean, because the Mark 23, great gun for the requirement, but you just cut it, it down it, and it, made it something practical. Well, yeah, and that one prototype that we did, and uh, it worked um, – but for some reason, that was one of one, and Germany didn't take any notes, or the program didn't really feel like the modification. I don't know what they felt. Well, I can imagine like they, the Germans, if, this if, we, if Ameri- we had an idea to do something. If this American asshole yeah. cut the gun down, it's what the guys wanted. Yeah. It's not a. You could, yeah, that, that goes without saying. Yeah, yeah. that was a sore spot at sight, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. The, the European gun makers have a <sighs> sense of pride that is. Uh, Unbreakable, it seems. You know, <laughs> yeah. no, no compromise there. That's yeah, that, that obviously no H- American H- cowboys. That's obviously H- HK's. You know, mantra, right? Yeah, yeah. And they're also their sense of humor is no laughing matter. That's true. That's true. But those those are good fun times with that little project. And uh, but uh, but yeah, that was. Um, but I don't think uh, we had a few there in our armory that we supported for a little while. But I don't think um, I could probably. Name on one hand, how many guys carried him? Yeah, yeah. And the that, Sig, Sig was Sig, the two two six was the, yeah. the flagship pistol at the command and all through naval special warfare for since nineteen ninety 
eight or nine. Yeah, when, I think when it's Deborah what brought made brought it on board, and then and then NSW followed shortly after. So yeah, I think it's what made Sig really popular with the commercial market for a long time, and that's that's an important thing when you talk about the overlap, like doing stuff for the military, the government, and with the cloner boys, how that can kind of take over, mm-hmm. you know and I mean, the 226 for 20 years is just known as the Navy SEALs pistol. It was. And what a great, I don't, I don't know. I mean, from my standpoint, my novice perspective, it's a great pistol and it served your dudes. And yeah. Ethan, you probably have shot one more than any person on the planet. What do you yeah. think? How's the 226? Tell us about the 226. Well, there's three full size 9mm handguns that are essentially the same the 17, 226, USP. Like those three guns. They're the most reliable handguns on the planet. USP, yeah, yeah, because HK's kind of even gone. They went away from that. Yeah, so like the P30 is essentially a USP with... Yeah. What about their striker gun? Is it in that or did you ever test that or do an evaluation? We started benchmarking it a little bit, but I was out of pistols by then, but... HK's striker gun. Yeah, there's a P30 with a striker upper, right? Yeah, the yeah. V- VP9. VP9. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've got one. Still in the oh, box. You do? Yeah. <laughs> Well, their P30 is the best feeling oh, handgun you'll ever I loved put it. Your hand. You're right. That's, yeah. that, that was the best, uh, yeah. the best Ergonomic. ergonomically uh, yeah. designed was, pistol that yeah. HK's I, ever done. I shot, so when I was at H&K, so before I went to SIG, I spent a couple months over there and in Germany and stuff and the range with all the engineers. So I shot the very first prototype VP9, their striker gun, and it looked, like, Jay, you'll appreciate this, it looked like a high point nine millimeter. I mean, it is ugly. The slide was huge and... I shot it, but it was clunky and big. And, you know, of course, they turn into something elegant that looks great. And I think it's a pretty good gun, but I, I don't I don't know. But, I, yeah, I, remember I shot the, the first prototype no, one of those. Yeah. yeah. There's a story. I think it was Mike Day that told it about the 226. He got shot 27 times. Right. Um, what? It's a lot of times. Yeah. He, He's he, alive? Yeah, I think 11 actually went into his body, but and his armor caught the rest. Yeah. Um, oh, so he's only shot 11 times. Right, yeah. Pussy. So he, <laughs> uh, he, in all of it, he ended up losing oh his rifle, God. pulled out a two two six, and I believe he took a round in the grip, and he said, "I he said I could feel the springs, and I could just feel the guts of the gun in my hand." And he shot four dudes with it, and it, he's like, "It worked." He walked himself to the helicopter after well, too. Yeah, what a that's an amazing story. Yeah. The grips Mike Day. don't. Mike the Day. grips don't make the gun work. <laughs> no, I know, I know, but I'm just like to, for that, it to take a round. Ra- that's take where the ammo comes and, from, though. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, right through the middle. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God. He's got a book out. Yeah. I don't he know. He does. Mike. So, so Mike. he was. I don't know Mike personally, but I've seen him uh, social media, and he's done some. So he's from the command. Like I don't know who he is. Yeah. That he told that story on. Uh, there's a podcast called Mike Drop with Mike Ritland. He was a. He's a canine guy. Um, well, what's he do now? I think he. What do, What do all seals do? They write books. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what Mike is doing full time or, uh, but. He's had some visibility lately, but I don't know him personally. Oh, that's yeah. awesome though. So yeah. with crazy two two six four. That's got to be a scary moment. You shoot dudes with a pistol. Oh, my God. Well, man, what a stud. Yeah, 11 was, rounds? Things yeah. have gone bad. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, insane well, story. Well, thank God those idiots don't have better ammo. Yeah. Well, you know the story of R.J. Thomas. I told you, Commander Thomas, he was one of the lead guys on the on the uh, SOCOM pistol program back in the 80s of Vietnam. He covers himself up with a dead guy and kills four or five guys with his 1911 and gets the guys, you know, he evac, had evac out of there. Oh, my God. Yeah, but, he, you know, he, he uh, deservedly earned the Navy Cross for that. Oh, good for him. 1911. Well, so. You told me about one of the guys last night took 11 rounds of AK in the stomach. Yeah, the yeah. Line. matter of fact, he's my neighbor still uh, and still back back in the mix. So. I mean, you told me that story, and what did I say to you? Like, it's so unbelievable you wouldn't even put it in a movie. No. Yeah. I mean, some it's of hard, those. It's hard to fathom when you're tore, that tore up that, you, that they can keep you alive. But, uh that was a just nothing short of a miracle. I mean, it's been, and I'm sure you feel the same way, and probably more so than me. But just supporting those guys, like, what an honor! I mean, honor, I, like, you, yeah. Uh, I get, I, how I, incredible! Yeah, well, I get, uh, I get a little heavy emotionally when I think about just the opportunity I had to serve those guys at that level. You know, just from a civilian, yeah, guy. You know, I was just. I mean, all of us looks like a right front tire changer, you know? What yeah. I mean? And, uh, but, but you uh, got, you got to have it. You got to have a team, you yeah. know, and a guy that we all know and like a cousin yeah. of your organization, 77 holes in him. Yeah. Yeah. 77 holes in him. He's still fine. And you know, I mean, a AK round through the chest right here, passed through. And, yeah. 
and you know, to, shook it off. You know, a couple of years later, 21 surgeries, he's back doing it. I'm like, what in the world? You know, or our friend at your group loses his leg, goes back into poise. Yeah. Like, holy o, shit. Oh, Tubbs. Yeah. He's one of a kind. Oh, boy. I got to mention his name here, man. He's my best friend. And uh, uh, I know he's going to be watching this. So uh, he's down in Texas doing some fucking offer, maybe a little bit of training. But uh, <laughs> training. He'll, he'll be glad to hear it. But uh, uh, yeah, he's. Uh, He's near and dear to me, and uh, we've uh, shared a lot of times overseas in hotels and bars and uh, um, several memorable moments uh, at, at HK for sure. So, Well, I mean, what kind Drinking of... Drinking out of his leg down at the bar. Oh, down it's so door. gross. I hate when he does that. <laughs> yeah. It's like a shoe. Uh, but... Trey's the first one every time. No, you got to be at least a second or third. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like a shoey, but worse. Yeah, yeah. worse than that. His uh, nub all sweating in it. Uh, how many times that's going on? I can't remember. Oh, I can't so even so gross. It. Yeah. But, um, yeah, for him to be in, yeah, probably one of the worst operations in, in this war. Yeah, yeah. The, to, to quote uh, Al Mack, who uh, I mentioned yesterday was a helicopter pilot when I um, was honorably invited to go to uh, Brooks Slabinski's uh, Medal of Honor ceremony at the White House two years ago. I sat right next to Al Mack, and he was the 47 pilot that took the first hit when uh, when Fifi fell out the back. And um, so can we can we say what it is? It, uh, Operation Operation Anaconda. Anaconda. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. you know Robert Bridge. There's a book about it. If uh, people out there have not heard of it, uh, I encourage it, you to read it. If it's you ridiculous. They, haven't, the made books, a, they so. haven't made a movie the about this. It's amazing. Because it sounds like the most terrifying. Yeah. Uh, like it, worst case scenario fucking happened all the way around. And it wasn't just for a minute or one one helicopter going down. This lasted for hours and hours and, you know, nearly a 24 hour evolution. And, uh, yeah, because yeah, Stephen, he was out there a long With, time. Uh, right? A lot of casualties. Yeah, and you know, and you, you you celebrate the good times, and then um, you, you mourn you mourn the bad ones, and uh, it's just the sense of community that I was so fortunate and honored to be a part of, even at my level. Um, like I said, it 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 gets in you. And, yeah, uh, well, I mean, you say that, but it takes a team. Like yeah. these guys, and, and this war has really highlighted them. Uh, whether it's blue or green or whatever. Right. If you don't have the guys devoting the time and the passion, developing the weapons, um, the night vision, the uniforms, the boots, the silencers, everything, everything, individual soldier stuff. Right. Because, you know, when those guys are on the ground, I mean, they're just, they're alone and isolated for a long time. So every little bit of advantage that they can garner you you know i mean this is survivability it's what we're trying to support these guys with so i don't think you can downplay it because i know the guys when they talk to me about you there's never any downplaying it like you do it's you you know it takes guys like you guys like ethan like you got to have the passion to go and do it and to build the best thing if we want a few guys to go and risk their lives all the time to do something you know really heroic because we decide you know and maybe rightfully so we just don't want to nuke the entire world right i think it's got to send guys to shoot people that's what happens i think this specifically is a cool it touches on a lot of cool things where when i think the general person thinks of these tier one groups and they think that all the designs and all the innovations come from within the military um and i mean just being around you guys like no you're all from the civilian sector and yeah i mean this is a good point because i mean i i, I tell you what um you're right if we don't and this is another reason why it's so important is we can't give in to the bullshit regulation of commercial stuff and you know you have joe biden or whoever saying oh civilian doesn't need an AR." like shut the fuck up all right <laughs> if you don't have the commercial market funding this stuff developing this stuff in conjunction with or separate from the government our guys will not have the best stuff let joe biden go to some of these guys funerals see their little kids yeah, you know you and i know you and i both have true. known guys who've been killed deployed while their wives are pregnant oh yeah. yeah and they don't ever know their dad and it's like every advantage we can give these guys to be able to come back you know, because we ask a lot of them because, you know, we decide as a society we're not going to Hiroshima and, you know, Nagasaki places. Yeah. And you got to send dudes in there who, you know, all these guys would probably be successful in whatever they did. But they choose this life. They go and do this shit and they risk their lives to go and shoot these dudes rather than us dropping a bunch of thousand pound bombs over there. And 
you know, they need every opportunity to come back. Yeah. And the civilian sector is so important. I mean, the Chris Barrett episode, we talked about Chris it. Like, yeah. Ronnie didn't do that for the military. Did it because he could, because he was in a country where he was allowed to do that. And look what it turned into. And yeah. that gun's helped. Yeah, their approach yeah. is great cool. that it's the freedom of this country being you drives know, you know, innovation second yeah. amendment drives yeah. innovation and it's support i mean you know in 70 countries allied countries right now helping you know us to enjoy the freedoms we have i mean you know barrett designs stuff that helps your guys and well you know we could you do it people like myself that worked inside the fence that work closely with the requirements and the operational side of uh what drove um critical requirements for equipment the first thing we do, and I always did, it was establish and maintain your network of community within the industry. You know, I yeah. kept it. I kept it 360. I didn't just have a lane of of vendors or experts or people that knew more than me about it or had the manufacturing capability or the engineering capability. Uh, we used everybody we could, depending yeah. on where we were going, and sometimes more than one. Blackout being a, a good example, but. Uh, we never did it by ourselves, and, and I always was um, a very staunch proponent of maintaining a good network of people like yourself that uh, that helped me help the guys do the, well, best, thank you. the, best, the best shit. I know yeah. we want to support those guys, but for us, for the company to grow, like a lot of our projects, like, you know, right. we've done stuff, you know, when mm -hmm. you were still at command for you guys, there is no overlap, right. and that's fine. It's like this is just for the dudes to go to help kill this one guy. No problem. But a lot of the projects need to make sense because we're going to make the money on the commercial market. And for me, you know, I feel like if I'd made a billion dollars off the government, I'm going to spend 99% of it back in the company to develop new technology to support the guys. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it's just how we're driven. And well, it's like the 239s right. you guys had. Mm -hmm. I would say it's probably less than 100 rounds shot in real life. Yeah. We probably shot, it was 1.5, 1.75 million rounds testing those guns. Wow. So, yeah, like, the SIG P239, yeah. the little compact. I like that little gun. Yeah. yeah, it was a good gun, That's and good we gun. did a lot of work on it. But, but I, you know, if they but, know they can't sell it in the commercial market, it's like how much can you spend as a company? And for right. me as a business leader, and especially with – the, the the small arms market on the commercial side, like we got we got Trump in charge, or we got Bush Jr., and you know you feel good about putting you know uh, everything you got into development for products that we can sell. But you got like Biden or Obama mm -hmm. or Clinton in office. It's like uh, you know, do you get Sig to put? all of this money into the development of this gun to make sure it's reliable for your guys if they know they can't sell it on the commercial market? No, uh, yeah, it's a matter of priority when it comes to the politics and how it shifts. Yeah, that's for sure. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough. But, I mean, I think that's where what, Jay, you're probably trying to say is, is like, the commercial involvement and the overlap. Like, it's very important to the development of products for you guys because, like we talked about earlier, like shooting something that's living that's about the same size whether it's a pig a terrorist a deer it's all kind of the same shit it is yeah you know and how can we do it as efficiently as possible yeah terminal um, terminal effect you know that's yeah keeping that's guys a, that's low a common biz. phrase that uh at the end of the day you know yeah and, and i think so so to get to blackout um because you know i've told my version of blackout from my perspective, and, you know, Ethan will have his own, but, John, you, you know, what was yours? And, and for those people watching, so 300 Blackout, from my perspective, and I want to say it first and then, and then you, is is it was a commercial thing by J.D. Jones. It was around for a long time, and um, I didn't have a ton of interest in it, but si it was kind of a perfect storm. Silencers were growing. I was selling the company to Remington, so they had an ammo yeah. division silencer use was growing on the commercial market and in the military um and you know I, i'm there working with you on our stuff silencers for the navy's guns or whatever and um and you just from my perspective you're like hey before you guys go an ammo company's buying you i'm working on this project you guys ever heard of 300 whisper you want to help me on it yeah so what's your version of yeah. it in the history? Like, how did it start? Because I don't know where you really started with it. Yeah, the interest came. You know, we, we were we had the 416s in service for maybe a year, year and a half, and, and we knew we lacked 
a, a quiet subsonic, you know, CQB clandestine shipboard subsonic capability for, for the HK416. And they had, they had put some money and R&D effort into this for two or three years, maybe four. I know Black Hills was working on it, and they were... What a tr- great company, oh, talking yeah. about I mean, supporting the guys. Le- Black Hills, that family, they should be given some medal by the government. I'll tell you what, legacy um, contributors to a lot of success. That, that Hoffman that, family, yeah. their dedication yeah. to getting you, your guys the best thing. Yeah, no argument with, there. Yeah, oh my God. Yeah, yeah great, I mean, great supporters and... Uh, Lean forward is 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 a is not saying enough what Thank those you. guys have always, uh, always done. But uh, but yeah, the three hundred blackout um, back up. We're in Germany doing a design review, and we're down at Axheim at their outdoor range doing some testing of whatever system we're mm-hmm. testing. Maybe MP seven at the time. And by the way, I don't know the first or second most reliable gun machine gun HKs ever produced. Yeah, yeah, wonderful gun. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah. Okay. So sorry. So anyway, um, and it's 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 after lunch or something. It's kind of recreation time, and and they bring some other stuff down to show us. And they had a G thirty six down there, suppressed in 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 uh, three hundred whisper. And uh, Wolfgang Bentley is the design engineer at the time that we're working with. On is a famous guy on our side of six, sixteen for... and seventeen. Yeah. And um, so we're just kind of it's, it's we're kicking around and we're playing, and, and I'm at the range there shooting out their their uh, their shoot house there. So I get this G thirty six and. and in uh, 300 whisper and i was never really a subsonic guy at all and it was it was intriguing to me i said man this thing was just we were just ringing small targets at 100 meters with this thing and so i, I look over my shoulder i said wolfgang i said can you build me one of these in a 416 upper and so he, funny how shit starts yeah I mean, and that's the thing like, you got to get on the range pull was, the trigger get exposed and it was just things that cl- the, the two things came together in my head is that we've been working so hard to try to find a five, five, six reliable subsonic solution for the, for the rifle. Weren't getting anywhere with it. And I thought, well, if we can build an upper that we can drop on, is just, uh, an add on capability that gets them where they need to be with subsonic. You know, we're not buying guns because it takes a different color of money from the budget side to, oh, to buy guns and it does to buy, buy components. And yeah. upper is just all components. So, one thing led to another, and uh, this is in the springtime, March or April, and uh, they they make some notes, and, and uh, by AUSA 2006, I believe, they give us a presentation, and uh, they do their dil- due diligence. So the big army show. AUSA. Yeah, yeah, and we always have our meetings with our with the critical vendors that we're, we've got things in motion with there and places like that, so... Um, they lay it all out for us, and uh, it's going to take some time and money that... Uh, Obviously, it wasn't their idea to do this, so they're not really super horny about it, if for lack of a better phrase. So. I like that <laughs> phrase a lot. So Jay, your hair they, looks great. They, uh, <laughs> they, they, they need R&D money to do that. And of course, you know, I didn't have any authority to designate R&D money for that, but I, I knew I could make this work. And, and if I had just a little bit of a, a, a chink in, in that, acquisition armor i could i could i could feather this up the back stairwell yeah, for lack of a better phrase you know i've yeah. seen uh yeah in my couple months over there in germany at, at, at the time you know of course they had i uh, saw all their prototype stuff but at h and k and open door headquarters in the cafeteria they have a uh right before you enter there's a glass display case mm-hmm. and one of the guns in that was a G36 mm-hmm. with uh, and 300 whisper with a silencer on it. Yeah, they were using B&T silencers, I think, which were boat anchors, but they they were effective. <laughs> and that's, you know, they were they were just in the country, just up below, you know, across yeah. the border. So, nonetheless, the, the concept really really interested me, and uh, I came home and knew I didn't have any money to do this with, and I I start doing the, the sneaky approach. I, I get a hold of my good friend Bert Roethlisberger at Ruag and see what he's got for ammo in the states. Oh, Bert! Yeah, he's cool. He's he's a good man, yeah. and um, he sends me a few, and it all comes in under the wire. And I'm telling on myself here, but uh, um, we get that, and I'm looking for a, a fast twist barrel because I know what it's going to take. So I call back. To I, know, I know. Uh, well, you know, to stop for a second, anybody running a group like this, you need to find a guy like John. <laughs> like mm. you got to be willing. Yeah, I mean that passion and knowing, and this is going to help the dudes and having the relationship with the guys, not viewing it as a job. That's yeah. how shit happens. I tell you what, I've never had so much fun and got paid for it than 
any other human being on the face of this earth. I got to say that. You know, you have the right job if, if that's the case. Like to me, when I say I've only worked two years in my life, it's true. The second year at SIG and the second year after I sold to Remington. And I used to say like, I thought I was the luckiest guy in the world, except for maybe Hugh Hefner, like (laughs) in in his heyday, not in those weird later days. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyhow, going back to uh, the blackout piece, I called back to my buddy Pat Mitter not at Crane. I said, hey, Pat, what is, whatever barrel you have, if you've got an old bolt gun barrel, find me the fastest twist that's marked that you can measure, put a, put a cleaner rod in it, measure it, find me the fastest 30 cal barrel, twist barrel you, you've got up there on a the rack. And uh, he found an old nine twist barrel that came out of a bolt gun from someplace back in the day, sent it to me. So I turned it into, uh, machined it into an, a shorty, you know, AR or M4 profile and just starting with gas ports and locations didn't know uh use a, a standard feed ramp and chambered it in 220 or 300 whisper you know with the 220 uh, uh bullets and everything and um had an old qd 30 cal m110 can that we had from oh, an early i wish kick. i had it down here thomas i'll yeah. uh, we'll take a picture after we'll hold it up Deal here i've got from one. one of the the later um Variants that we did with our early SR-25. Yeah, so, so it's their, in, what is it called? The Knight's what? NT4? Well, there's the NT4, but was the M110 well, the, can? The, no, no. Okay. What he's talking about is just the NT4, but it has a 30 caliber bore. Oh, through I got so the, yeah, Originally, yeah. it was the M4 QD. Right. Yeah. And they just put a 30 caliber bore. So a lot of like the 16, 14-inch SR-25s have this little can on yeah. it. It was residual from one of the upgrades we did from the full-up SR-25s that we got back in the early 90s, and we... We did two or three iterations of them and, and changing them into carving variants, and it was one of the 30 cal cans yeah. that we had that we could use for this. Because they so. shortened the guns up. The original SR25 can was a thread mount that went on the gas block and was like yay long. And then there's the M110 that's the. Right. Maybe it's a screw. Got the little plunger gate type. Well, the Mark 11 has that. I yeah. think the, is the M110 still a threaded or is it a. Do you know? No, it. I think it's the gate. It is the gate. Yeah. yeah. So the original ones were threaded, but once they shortened the barrels up, you couldn't put that over the barrel silencer on it. So they just took their NT4, or at the time was probably called the M4QD. Right. And they just bore a 30 caliber hole. Yeah, and that's what we had on those K models that came in as a as a product improvement yeah. for that back uh, a couple of years before we're trying this. But that was the only 30 cal suppressor that I could put into this little prototype system that we'd kind of frankenstein together with uh using this ruag ammo and um i got some guys out there from gold and uh tom ratzliff was one of them he was a big proponent of it believed in what we were doing and uh my good friend spanky uh, got on the range and the gun would run a couple of times and then we had to come back and plug a hole and redrill a gas port and put a shorter tube on it and uh put set screws in the it was pretty crude we weren't worried about actually we were just worried about proven yeah, trying to get it to function proven concept and and uh Building the guys. Because, I mean, we all knew, and the guys knew, too. Like, the more you shorten the barrels on their 5.56, five, right. the more the dudes with the AK have an advantage when you're talking about relatively close quarters. Yeah, yeah. and, you know, this was this was really designed for, you know, subsonic CQB shipboard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, the shipboard thing was, you had to worry about collateral stuff, and I uh, don't need to be talking out of my lane here, but being there you had, and doing what I did for these guys, you have to understand what, what they're doing and where, yeah, they're, of course. where they're doing yeah. and why. So, um, you know, if, if you're on a cruise ship and you've got subsonic that's moving slow and, it, you, you know, the whole upper structure of a, of a ship is aluminum, partitions and walls and things like that. So we had to be sensitive to uh, overpenetration and uh, 5.56 five, and even frangible stuff sometimes would be a little more than what we were looking for. So this whole subsonic component based on what eventually came uh, to be 300 blackout, um, was was seemed to be a solution and yeah then we, moved, we, and we moved forward with you guys because we were you know actively involved in getting the suppressors for the for the uh 416s and the 417s yeah. and you guys were uh you know the best direction to go we had business and and engaged and uh so, asked yeah. you guys to come into that meeting we met out there in that little double wide trailer and, and oh and, yeah yeah and laid right. it all out outside my shop yeah so for those listening the yeah seven t- to sdn six that's uh, a, a silencer design that we were using on a you lot know, of stuff. You know where that, that recently came up on Instagram about the the N6 piece? Well, I don't know. I just know you told me to put N6 on the back tip because yeah, that was y'all's model. Yeah, because it was Navy. I think it was Robert said Navy. It was for Navy. Yeah. And 
six. Yeah. 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 So, so we, we, um, we were doing those. And so, cause it seems the way I tell the story is, um, that basically we came up with the length of the silence here because there was some sort of something where 14 and a half inch guns went in and no. we picked nine inch because that silencer that you guys already had on there overall equal to like the 14 and a half inch with the bird cage on it. So it would fit into something. Yeah. Is, is that, that what right? it was? It was the, the seven, six, two SDN six for the four seventeens on a nine inch barrel was the same length as a four sixteen with the M four 2000 on it. That's that the deal. That's oh, how it ended oh. up. That's how we ended up with nine inch for the 300 okay, block. Well, I was a little off. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah you, I, I, don't, I, don't, either, I don't, don't remember know. those. Cause the requirement for 300 blackout upper was the length was the same as the 416 M4. upper. Oh, no, the 416 with the M4 2000 on it. Okay. Okay. That's how that. So basically length. Inch yeah. I don't so that, so it was details. like, okay, cool. We're yeah. a nine inch, 300 blackout well, barrel. Well, from my standpoint, it was like, you're asking to look at it and you're like, look, we've got it pretty reliable, but right. you know, and then we go back and um, work with the engineer, Jason M. Hoff at, uh, you know, Robert and Ethan do some work. And, you know, I knew within shooting it a couple of weeks, like this is a thing. And it's like, maybe it'll be a thing for the Navy. Like, I don't know. And, um, but commercially ARs were becoming very popular. Silencers were becoming very popular. Like, this is the next 30, 30. We're going to do this. Let's support it. Mm-hmm. And it seemed to me like you guys were just having a reliability issue. So we go and, you know, design the proper, you know, fix all the problems like JD Jones and 300 whisper using 308 bullets. They don't feed that reliably. They're not taking up all the space in the magazine when you have, you know, short supersonic bullets. Right. And so we developed projectiles. And yeah, stuff and I forgot were. to mention that. You know, we didn't mean to just totally road stomp JD's technology or his ideas. It had been around no, for a long he time. He wasn't interested in participating. And in the he was invited. Though. He was invited in, and we tried his stuff. And and um, it just um, it wasn't ready for prime time. And that uh, you know, and because uh, you probably you might not even know this, but you know, I was in communication with JD Jones at one point, mm-hmm. and he wanted to supply barrels, but he wanted six hundred dollars a barrel. Yeah. And you know the barrels are a hundred bucks. Yeah, whatever. he wanted to keep it proprietary, and and there was no way we could take it and use it the way we wanted. Yeah, to. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, even though he had kind of that way. done it, I don't think he believed in it the way I did. And but y- you know, I mean, the way he was doing it with the three hundred eight bullets, it could have never worked for you guys. It would never work commercially because it wouldn't be it wouldn't meet the reliability. It'd work commercially like uh, where some of those other cartridges like four fifty eight SOCOM or. Some of these other yeah. weird AR cartridges. Oh, it's a great art six eight SPC, great killing cartridge. But it's like I say in the other podcast, you got to have a delivery system. You got to have a magazine. You got to yeah. have a gun. Yeah, and it can be reliable enough for you to go deer hunt. But you know, this is a whole another set of requirements. And you know, for us to know, and, and you know, and Ethan, w- w- de- as you develop eight six, all the lessons we learned from three hundred blackout. Full mag capacity. We don't want to modify the bolts. We want, you know, reliability is key. We want both super and subsonic. Because you, you were looking at the subsonic capability at the time. But if you pigeonhole it, I believe, even still commercially, to just subsonic, you're really pigeonholing yourself. Like, I shoot 300 blackout every week. I kill stuff constantly with it. Most of the stuff I kill with it is supersonic. Well, most of the shooting I do with it is subsonic, and I kill some stuff with the expanding subsonic, but most of the stuff is with the supersonic. To be honest with you, that was the that was the bonus round for Blackout was not really knowing or understanding how good we could make this and how much of a capability increase you could build into that with uh, the supersonic bullet variants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still, I mean, you know, as I'm known sort of as the silencer guy and and all that, I still. You know, there are cartridges that'll probably eventually compete it, you know, in some way, either on, you know, the military government side or commercial side with this that are just subsonic only. And like I love subsonic. But, you know, I also like kill a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. And sometimes subsonic's good enough, you know, for inside a hundred meters and all this, and sometimes if it's two hundred and twenty five meters and that's the animal I want, like I need the supersonic capability. And the unique thing about blackout with the ammunition we finally ended up with, you could you could stagger super sub, super sub, super sub all the way through a 30 round magazine. Reliable. And count on a 12 inch offset from a headshot to a chest shot 
from a supersonic to a subsonic <laughs> with the same gun, no gas block modification, no gas block switch, nothing. It just ran, ran, ran. Yeah, because that was part of the original deal yeah. was no adjustable gas block. So, I mean, you're right. We talk 100 meters and, you know, you're still and that was the stitching perfect op- a guy up. That was the perfect operating range for, you know, 98.5% of what really goes on. And it's, it's, it's the and, same and you thing can, with and you hunting. Can push, and you can push it out to four with, sub, with supersonic. With, yeah. with the right optics and you know we we uh we toyed around with different reticle options and sights and things like that to be able yeah. to use uh you know both both velocity options with one optic so yeah, yeah. i mean and that's a tough one with some of the electro optics that's going to become feasible right but i know you, you, you know in uh your organization and some others they use it or viewed it a little differently so you know after we did uppers and silencers and ammo for you guys which you know i talked about earlier and i've said on previous podcasts so from us socom we get a million round order of ammo and i'd sold the company to remington and because they refused to make the ammo we got that on hand loaded ammo so just like you john clements there's ethan and there's robert silvers and eric burt like we're just driven and they weren't getting more money and i wasn't getting more money for going the extra mile and working on sundays but we're okay well fuck remington they're such assholes they're not going to load the ammo for us like what is wrong with you guys? The only military contract they had at the time was what? Shotgun ammo or something? Yeah. And it's like, we have U.S. SOCOM requesting this ammo. They're like, you get a contract, little buddy, you let us know. How, how do you get a contract without ammo? So what do we do? We loaded it in Robert's basement. We got a contract yeah. for a million rounds. They suspended me from work and investigated <laughs> me from 30 days for bribing a military official. Merry Christmas. And it's like, yeah, you guys are so pathetic. That's what you think happens. And it's like, no, this is like young people being motivated. Yeah. Like, we're going to make it happen even if you say, you know, the plan only operates four days a week or whatever. Or we're selling 223 ammo to Bass Pro Shop for six cents a round so we can't make your ammo. Yeah, they totally missed uh, the the true statement there. Yeah. Yeah. Idiots. And to me, what I saw selfishly was this is going to be commercially extremely successful. Mm Mm-hmm. And it gives you guys capability, but you guys had your own thing. And, you know, and, and, and for, you know, another organization that we designed the honey badger for, they didn't want replacement uppers. And the way I viewed that was, okay, well, you have MP5 SDs. The life cycle has been up for 25 years. We'll make a gun to replace that. And it's a subsonic gun that, Hey, you can shoot supers with. And, you know, the idea is if the guys use those guns, Mm -hmm. And they get in a situation where they have to shoot with supersonic ammo, you know, you can engage targets at 300 meters. So you got something, if you got a guy with a PKM or whatever shooting at you, like you can return fire. Yeah. Um, you know, where if you have a subsonic nine millimeter with the barrels ported and you're shooting a 380 and the dude's two blocks away, like you're fucked. Yeah. And, and that was a capability for them. And, and, um, you know, so thank you. I mean, we would have never done it without, you pushing us. Johnny Noveski gave me an upper a year or two before he was super yeah. into 300 whisper shot a lot of stuff with it. But you know, I wasn't loading ammo at the time. You couldn't buy ammo except Corbon for $45 a right. box of 20. Right. So I didn't really shoot it much unless he loaded and sent me ammo. But when you gave us the push, you know, and, and, and you, I probably should think you several things. First of all, 300 blackout would have never happened. And then, you know, guys have used it operationally. The cartridge has been adopted it's been successful and then me uh you know it's been great on my resume for the part that i played but also it's probably one of the things that led to me getting thrown out of remington which in the end <laughs> is, it probably know, worked out good for me and ethan and everybody that, that was going to happen you need 300 blackout or not yeah well, <laughs> like, do you need a thank you or an i'm sorry it does, i don't know which, which way uh, <laughs> not an i i'm sorry i mean i i don't think you know things wouldn't have turned out you know the way they have and i think it's for the best and then i'm excited yeah well it was uh you know we we're just fortunate to be able to to sneak that one in i have to say it that way because uh um it was fun and it worked, well and it worked and you that, saying that and it's still there makes so. me think of ethan and his team when we talked about this commercially like oh biden and what he's proposing you know and talking to nick the other day an engineer that works under ethan a senior guy he's the one that did He's the lead on the fix. And he's like, who gives a shit what they do? You know, the government's going to do what they're going to do. And it's like, you know, they're going to come out with some bullshit 
And then we're just going to look at those regulations and we're going to design and build stuff around it and keep being successful. And that attitude's, you know, what I want to foster. Yeah, I was never afraid to break a few eggs. You know what I mean? And uh, if you want an omelet, yeah. you got to do that. Yeah, and that's not, that, that's right. And not be afraid. You know, we talked about failure last night when we were just talking about general shit, you know. But it's like uh, you, you can't go in being afraid of it, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah. front sight focus all the, all the way through, regardless of what you're doing, you know. Yeah, I- anybody. And there's so many people that we probably, well, all of us know that are brilliant people. And I can name a few that we've worked with who, who could be way happier, way more successful but they're so insecure and so afraid to fail, mm. so afraid of the criticism yeah. that they don't do the right thing or take the chance. Yeah, and you know, then you end up not as entitled as the rest of us that do. And well, and, and I don't care. Like the criticism, you know, as you said, Jay, I'm very polarizing on the social media. But all the criticism, it's like, yeah, you can point out all my failures. Like, let's point out your successes. Yeah. Like I don't give a shit. Yeah, like, they, they kind of go together. You know, you. Uh, you want to fail and learn early, you know, and it, uh, it, it builds confidence down the road. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean uh, that attitude you've got, I think Ethan leading engineering and, and I spoke to it yesterday. It's like, okay, here's what we're going to do here. Here's what the numbers and the math and computers tell. And I'm going to translate some of what Ethan says. So when I'll be correct, but it's like, we're, we, we know what it should do. So we're going to go and break it all. You know, because we want the lightest, fastest, best thing to meet mm-hmm. this requirement. Mm-hmm. So we got to go break stuff. Yeah. And if we don't break stuff, then we didn't do our job. Okay, then we're going to back off. Yeah. You know, and we're going to go from there. When we break stuff, okay, what broke, why, and then yeah. we're going to fix it. You know, and that's how you end up, in my opinion, with stuff like the fixed rifle or the honey badger. Where how's the honey badger a pound and a half lighter than a gun that looks just like it from another company? Right. You know, it's because we actually did all the testing and we build all the parts and you take the weight out of everywhere. You and optimize, you, know what's you learn from your testing and, uh, you know, cradle to grave is a common phrase that we've all learned over, over our, our career that, uh, when you're working in, the, in, in this lane of, of, of work that, uh, it defines a lot of things and makes things better. Yeah. yeah. All right, John, we yeah. can go on about all this stuff for days. Let's, um, let's shift to your current position. So this will i don't know i hope it'll flow but so yeah. you, you left um and and, and i want to end circling back to some of the stuff you did at command <coughs> oh god you okay some of the stuff you did at command. i don't know <laughs> i feel pretty good though you look great I mean, can i kick i it? like your shirt yes you can yeah. yeah yeah my shirt that is a great shirt so speaking of that good segue so you left command uh five six seven years ago oh but he's seven years uh this next month, yeah, uh, 2014, uh, late April 2014. Okay, so, um, that yeah, a, that's... That was a bittersweet um, event for me, extremely I can Im- event. Yeah. I can imagine that. Yeah, after being there 16 years and, and enjoying the best of the best with the best. Uh, and, uh, but like I said, age and opportunity come together, and that's what kind of drove the decision to uh, jump off and go into industry and see what a real job was like. Nope. Yes, so yeah. you went to Proof, a new company, an emerging company. They were, yeah. The technology was something that, um, you know, carbon fiber wrapped barrels was um, something we tried back in the late 90s with Christensen. And um, it was a decent effort. Nobody knew much about it. Um, the, the the little project we did with, uh, with Wojo, with Dave Johnston, who I, I mentioned earlier, was... Uh, one of the early program leaders for the sniper team there back in the late 90s, early 2000s, was driving this nine-pound 300 Winchester for their tactical long-range gun. It's like, wow, that's a reach. You know, we were used to running, you know, intentionally building 14 to 16-pound guns, less yeah. less glass, right? And yeah. Big, heavy Baker McMillan stocks. I mean, great equipment, big, heavy steel barrels, and heavy guns shot well, and that's what they wanted. But... Uh, it was a time, and, and uh, you know, the operational tempo was pretty flat. Nobody was carrying guns at altitude and doing things like that, so heavy guns didn't matter. They yeah. Put, they put them in a, in, a, in a truck. They went to the range. They put them back in the truck, and they came back to the armory. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and even generally in use, drive very close to the target set up. Yeah, you know, so the, the, the whole lightweight improvement and, and – uh, building more agility into the gun systems and giving them more room to carry other things just wasn't there yet. So in, in the late nineties, maybe 2000, we, we tried this little project with Christensen and, uh, 
it was ill-fated. It didn't work out well. Nobody really knew what to do next, and uh, we tried one, a couple of their barrels, on, and um, we ha- couldn't keep them straight, and um, they didn't what, shoot. What, what do you mean couldn't keep them straight? After, after they did the production profile on the barrel and did the wrap. Um, so they're taking standard barrels. Mm-hmm. Turning down the yeah, center, I use, I use the phrase, kind of a dog bone. You do a reduction profile on a, on a on an engineered taper. That's the way proof does it. But uh, whatever Christensen was doing at the time, and then just laying, you know, carbon fiber prepeg uh, um, woven sheet carbon yeah. fiber to to build up uh, and trade the space with the steel that they removed, and it was a. Um, what I would consider, from what I know now about how proof does it, a, a simpler and more primitive and less engineered application for carbon fiber. Yeah, but for the commercial hunting industry, it was probably what was expected at the time, and uh, we needed more. And it, uh, I didn't even look back. We didn't do anything carbon fiber. I didn't even mouth the phrase carbon fiber for you know, till 2012. Yeah. And uh, one of my old bosses, Commander T.K. Davis, was a friend of a friend of uh, who was soon to be the oncoming CEO of Proof as it was being put together. Um, Captain Pat Rainey retired, former uh, Blue Angel guy, but uh, he wanted time with someone from the command, and T.K. recommended me, so... Long story. Oh, okay. So they were seeking someone from the command. Yeah. I mean, Pat Rainey had reached out oh, and said, nice. hey, how do I get in the dev group? How do I get in the dev group? And... And he and TK shared some time in the first Gulf War. Uh, Rainey was CAG, and TK was with the boat squadron. It deployed on the Truman back in those yeah. days, and that's how they got to to know each other. So, um, first Gulf War, so meaning 1991. Yeah, yeah early 90s. And uh, that's where their friendship started. So, uh, fast forward to 2012. Pat's dabbling with this, and they're looking at bringing him on as the CEO, and uh, they're looking for someone, you know, with. Uh, some experience, but uh, prior to that, um, I started a project with him after meeting with him at that shot show. And yeah, this was all driven by Pat's, you know, uh, request to be yeah, in- I mean, introduced. I, I, to, I remember to before you were there, some yeah. of your some of your guys um, yeah. turned me on to proof and, yeah. and the right one of the rifles. Oh, behind you, Jay. Do you want me to grab it? Yeah, if you want, you can hold it up. It was um, yeah, some of your snipers. We we're in an auction to benefit extortion 17 which we can talk about yeah. in a few minutes right. so where you guys lost a bunch of guys right and i um bid on this rifle and won it as a result of one of your uh snipers there telling me about it you can hold, right, you can hold it up and, uh, um yeah and, this is an early version of our our tac 2 stock um you know we weren't excuse me we weren't really much of a tactical rifle company at the time and uh this this is one uh, of the stock uh, designs that got as close as we could. You know, we're pretty much a lightweight hunting rifle company. So, so it feels great. Proof was building these stocks at the time. They were. Oh, okay. So I didn't even realize that. Very primitively, and we've obviously retooled and and upgraded and improved that whole process, and added a couple of new geometries to the line for the uh, different model rifles. So all of our stock uh, production is improved, modernized and. And so, in Montana, where it used to be done in, in Ohio at our at our composites so uh, engineering facility there. Okay, so so proof parent company's got a composites company in Ohio. Yeah, so they have. Um, that's what, our that's what? our proof advanced composites division. They're really the secret sauce to the guys. They they were brought on board as consultants in 2013 to help proof um, improve and increase their capability with higher temp resins to support. Yeah. You know, higher cyclic rates, uh, machine gun, and in the and late the, '90s, I was working carbon fiber with silencers, and yeah, mm-hmm. the Achilles heels always been the, been the temp- resin, been yeah. temperature threshold, right? Yeah, I didn't realize proof made stocks to be well, completely. Well, I didn't know they weren't back then because I thought these were Terry Cross or somebody. I didn't know you guys were making them. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I, oh. I, yeah, we're making all ours now, and that was one of the one of our earlier designs. Yeah. So. When was Extortion Seventeen? When did that happen? Uh, 2011. 11, yeah, yeah. 11 or 12, 11. Oh, so, okay. So just like the same time as Bin Laden. I was, was thinking right it was after before. Bin Laden was yeah, right after. Like, uh, it's like August 6, 2011. Yeah. 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 So, so that was, um, how many, how many guys were lost? Well, 31 total, uh, you Jesus. know, with the pilots and, uh, we had some vintage guys on there and then, uh, 21 guys from the command, 19, oh 19 seals, uh, 
lost a working dog, lost a dog handler, uh, all the crew. So 31 total. That's, yeah. the, that's where the, 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 uh, and they were all on the Chinook. Yeah. And it was just coming in slow. We, then they were on a, on a, on a QRF mission. Yeah. And they all, all but one guy from Gold Squadron 2 Troop, because he was home on maternity with his wife having a baby, lost them all. Oh my God. Yeah. That's, that, that was a tough time. Ooh. That was a tough day. I'll never forget it. I woke up. It was on a Saturday morning. And I'm driving in command to do a little workout. And I turned the corner, damn neck road, to head down towards towards the command. I just happened to look at my phone. And like 2, two o'clock in the morning, I get um, a text from Turbo that I didn't see till then. And it said, hey, we lost 20 guys last night. I thought, what the fuck? And um, I'm just a block away from his neighborhood. So I turn in there at 8 o'clock in the morning and go to his house. And it's so tough. Yeah. Well, man, I mean, I can't imagine because I know you're working with those guys ah, every day. Every day. When I they're mean, here. And two of the guys, you know. And, 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 and two, like a lot of the guys, probably like your kids at that point, like so many of them are so young. Yeah. I was, I, was, I don't know, like a father figure in age I probably was to them. But, you know, we were all just uh, – um, those guys are really special to me and a lot of people, you know. Yeah. And um, – it's really tough. Yeah, I mean, I, just, I knew several of them, and um, yeah, yeah. What a what a tragic, horrible thing. Yeah. Um, it's um, yeah, it was something that was a uh, made for a long few months of uh, memorial services. I think I I was able oh to go to nine of them, and uh, every every summer, uh, a handful of us guys, as civilians, and 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 a couple of still the active duty guys that. Uh, we do a motorcycle ride from Virginia Beach up to Arlington on the weekend, the oh, closest yeah. to, and then go to uh, Section 60 where they're all buried. Yeah. Yeah, what what a, I mean, two and kind of a fluke thing, and you just never know, man. Yeah, it's, it all comes down never. to decisions, and I'm, you know, I'm definitely not in a position to second-guess anybody's decision to where that went, but uh, it sure is tough to get news like that where you lose that many guys. and then, Yeah, uh, I mean, it was tough for me when I came up well, for the auction where I bought this and a yeah. charity event to raise money for the families and the mm-hmm. kids. And like, you know, first time I'd met some of the wives and, yeah. um, you know, some, and, you know, it makes it real when you see little kids sure there, you, you know? And, um, yeah, so I know, you know, Trey and I come up, we, we came up, we hung out, hung out with you and participated in the auction about stuff. And so one of your snipers, like this was in the auction. He's like, you have to buy that gun. He's like proof research in this carbon fiber stuff. It's awesome. I'm testing it right now. Buy that gun. <laughs> like whatever it goes for, the gun's great. And I tell you, I, I, I bought the gun. Um, and it was awesome. Everybody, everybody that participated proof in it, they signed the inside of the case. There's American flag. There's a note in yeah. it. It was this rifle. So I think this is a 20 inch 308. Probably. I've killed a ton of stuff with this. I love this gun. What year, what event did you buy that? Do you remember? <sighs> I don't know. It, it was it was soon after the it, first the first the biggest event we did because I was heavily involved in soliciting all of. I've got a flag and stuff downstairs. Of, uh, also bought at the auction. All of the contributors in industry to donate things, and it was huge. The first one was uh, in 2012, and then 13 and 14 followed on, and then it kind of 31 Heroes was the. Um, the foundation, and then we were doing our own thing in Virginia Beach, and it got really tangled and hard to manage so it just kind of faded away after about three or four of those fun, I, fundraiser events i bet it was 12 it was at some restaurant b- bar venue um that yeah, was probably the first one then because that's when uh, i wasn't even working at proof then no 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 you were still at command yeah then. because I, I i had already worked through the project in that year with uh the prototype proof barrels and the t e thing we did yeah, I think it's proof, it's proof during that time. It's yeah. when you guys were testing this, and yeah. and Terry yeah. told me to buy this gun. And then we uh, we uh, asked those guys to submit to this. They wanted to be a part of it, and that was sort of a building block into the relationship that we continued to build with the command and myself. And at the time, I had I had no inclination of going to proof or leaving the command. It was yeah. just something we were doing to in, improve and and build a better product for the shooters you know yeah so. yeah to do the barrels i mean especially when they're working at altitude and hindu kush or wherever yeah and, you know they can save i mean you know the barrel is generally the heaviest part of the gun and you can save some weight there that's great well, that's especially perfect. with the snipers you know sometimes it's you know it's different than a machine gun barrel yeah uh you know and give them the ability to carry more ammo um 
You Weight know. is everything. Yeah. Weight. I mean, ounces make pounds. And, because, uh, I mean, some you know some of your guys, too, studs, but, you know, 135, 40 pounds, little guys. Yeah. So, yeah, it makes it makes a huge difference. And, you know, the attributes of the technology from, uh, you know, reduced IR reflectivity to the heat yeah. to the stiffness. And, uh, and so, speaking of that, what people don't realize, cool faster, so know. if you think about, um, you know, if some of the bad guys, the enemies have uh, thermal or... Um, you, you know, drones with thermal or anything like that, like not picking up the heat signature, which a lot of times a barrel and or silencer, if there's a silencer involved, is where things can be that, spotted. That's your most radiant component on, on the system, right? Yeah. So, right. Yeah. So, so yeah, at that time, you never mentioned anything to me. I don't even think you did. Well, any, anyway, you, you retire, you go to proof, and – um. To me, it's amazing to see the transformation of proof. Like you went there, I'd barely heard of them. Um, you know, and I don't know if you want to talk about like size, like how proof's grown, but I know from my standpoint, without knowing you, how in the last five or six years, the impact that proof has made on the commercial military market, you know, is probably going to be part of the Mark 22 rifle with Barrett, which is uh, like the We news. sure hope so, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, and it makes a lot of sense, um, yeah. I think, in that standpoint. But even on the commercial market, the number, it's it's almost like silencers. The number of silencers that I saw when I would go on hunting trips 15 years ago compared to the number of silencers I see now, it's the yeah. same thing with proof research right. barrels. What makes, like, what what is proof? How did it start? Who's the parent company? What makes proof different than everybody else that wraps their barrels in carbon? Well, we have to give the the technology and the IP credit to the guys in Ohio. They're the ones that really gave the final definition to how the carbon and the and the stainless steel liner how they react together. Well, what are they normally doing? Like, what does that place do, or can you say that where they gain the expertise and the knowledge? Well, the two main guys that, that, that deserve all the credit for the material engineering and the application of the technology to the rifle barrels uh, is Dr. David Curlis and Dr. Jason Lincoln. These are two Ph.D. material science guys that are smarter than, than anybody I will ever know. Yeah. And um, they were working at the Air Force Research Lab at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and I don't think they'll care that I give them kudos here, but uh, their expertise um, in the aerospace industry was high temperature composite materials. They didn't make parts. They made materials for yeah, well for, okay, for that you make parts Roman. out of. And um, one of their biggest achievements that we're really proud of is um, the exhaust nozzle on the B-2 bomber has to sustain 600 to 650 degrees over a 24-hour you know, flight schedule. And they designed the high temp material that uh, that this particular okay, exhaust, for the exhaust yeah. on, on a B two, and then we've got critical components in uh, in in the F thirty five, and then uh, various other commercial S entities. So the, the proof facility in Ohio, they're developing materials for aerospace right. and the government military for these sorts of applications. Right, and, and then and then when we have special applications for say a, a higher heat. Uh, uh, resistance or a higher heat capacity for um, a, a DMR rifle or a you know a heavy assault rifle in 762 or some other caliber that has a higher firing schedule than a precision you know bolt action sniper or hunting rifle then there's a particular resin application for that and then there's a particular tier three for you know a thousand to twelve hundred degrees for machine gun barrels so oh you guys are doing machine gun barrels well we, we've done them we've proved we've got the material we haven't Ooh. had a program we just finished up a uh an army vertical lift program um with uh, the guys at RDEC. Uh, we did a few test barrels for uh, the apache m230 so, okay because i'm thinking for that like like when you say machine gun barrels Hmm. Thermal signature is one thing, but when we talk mobility, if you're talking aircraft and you're talking rotary, if you can save weight, weight. in the barrels, because I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't know. Most people have probably never handled, and Jay, maybe you did, like M250 cal barrels or machine gun barrels in general. Yep. If you can translate that weight savings, mm -hmm. which is, I don't know, you tell me, I would say half into ammunition. Yeah, the more space we can trade, the more weight we can save, and just just and say, that's great because then you can carry more ammo. Right. 
or other things. And uh, just, yeah, just other case, things and other person. Just case in point, we took nine pounds off the front end of that Apache with just the carbon barrel versus the steel barrel. Nine pounds. Same. Yeah. So it, it seems like maybe nothing for an aircraft, but that's where it's super important. Like an well, you, aircraft. You look at nine that, pounds of ammo. Max gross weight. Like oh, well, just look at how that 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 gun is is utilized and traversed with the servos as it's you know it it traverses with oh that's with, true with that's true so like so, swinging it like a shotgun so basically it's kind of slew rates and loads on on servos and things like so that. so that must just compound and add longev like longevity to the it to does what you're yeah. Saying, the it servos does yeah, yeah like it's so battery layers. power everything yeah. right right i think oh, the cool. i think the modus barrel itself is like 40 something pounds it just is. the barrel yeah it's 40 something pounds oh. yeah so okay you know, we've well, uh well, 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 what makes it different then? Because you, you you see whether it's now I think Bartline's doing them. Christensen's been around a long time. Like what separates gimmicks from the best product from a proof research product? Well, you know I can speak with what I know about what we do. I, yeah, I don't know what uh, what Bartline and what some of the their secret sauce is, but I know what ours is, and I know yeah. I know nobody's doing it like we are. They may be having some good success and making good carbon wrap barrels at their level. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of complimentary that, you know, that we have some of the better or the best in the, the high watermark, uh, steel cut rifle barrel companies in the world to kind of follow us into, uh, into this technology. Well, I, w- I will say, I didn't even realize you guys made steel barrels until we had some. And, um, the engineers in charge of the fix said that the best groups we've ever shot the best barrels we have are proof steel six five barrels shoot better than the bart line steel barrels better than our like they're the best barrels they've tested well that's good to hear because we've worked hard at getting there um all of our rifles are all single point cut all our machines are organically designed and built in-house with all servo controlled rifling we can do left we can do right we can do gain um you know um Still working on getting into some of that super tight gear stuff that uh, we'd like to do in, uh, real yeah. soon. Uh, getting it down to the threes and fours and fives. Uh, yeah, but, that fast but, uh, twist, that's going to be the thing for it this is. Uh, eight six right here. It mm. is. It is. But uh, from a growth perspective, you know, I, I came on in, in spring of 2014 and um, to a company that had just come together. It was Lone Wolf Stocks. It was K- uh, Gents Precision. KK Gents is our president. He had a little custom rifle shop and um, was using um, and Lawrence rifle barrels. Jeff Lawrence had a, had a small rifle company that was doing button and cut rifle barrels. And then um, um, Advanced Barrel Systems out of Nebraska. So those four small companies were pulled together by our, our our, our principal investor, Mike Gogan, and uh, it was rebranded as Proof Research. And so we built a new facility. I say we, it was being built uh, when in the midst of, of our R&D work with, uh, with the Navy. And it's out in Montana. Montana, yeah. Columbia Falls, just uh, pretty much at the end of the runway of uh, Kalispell Airport, right on Highway 2. And it's a, it's a 25 to 28,000 square foot facility, which is, is packed full now with everything we do from our full build rifles to all of our stock work and then um right, so you're doing the stocks the barrels you're building full rifles there mm-hmm. and we uh we use zermat as our one of our primary with a couple other action companies that i can't recall right now for a couple other model rifles that we offer zermat is that uh bighorn bighorn yeah yeah their yeah. action is incredible yeah, the, their agree. tl3 is is unmatched this is built on what a defiance it it's is an early gun yeah yeah that i like the bighorn action the defiance oh. is, is a good company um we had some supply demands and things that uh it's hard to get everybody to grow at the same time yeah the the gears just weren't meshing like um like we needed them to defiance is a great company and they do great stuff make a great product but um you know we had to you know do what we had to do to be successful and sometimes you gotta look and go other places but uh um Mike Gogan is, is uh, one of the primary investors in in uh, Defiance as well, and they're just four miles down the road from Proof, so we've got a, a, a good relationship and still still work with them. Where is that? Is that central Montana, eastern Montana? Whitefish, way, Council, way up in the northwest. No, oh, northwest. We're just west. 60 miles from Canada and 100 miles from Idaho. Oh. Yeah, right there in Glacier National Park is just, yeah. you know, I can look out the office windows from the factory and see the peaks in Glacier, which is 
pretty nice when you want him to take a break. So our, our buddy yeah. Andy Stumps out there. It's yeah. not my buddy. He's his buddy, but I'd well, like Andy, him yeah, my, I'd yeah. like him to be my buddy. Yeah. He's out in Kalispell. Yeah, I supported Andy when he was at the command, and um, he recently moved to Kalispell. We got several guys: uh, Chris Irwin and uh, a lot of former community guys are settling out there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, so. um, what makes a pre- proof research barrel worth? What are they? Nine hundred dollars. Well, like, you know, um, it's it's a lot of a lot of time and labor, you know, and the material and uh, engineering. It's 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 a, a lot of handling, you know. You we're doing all of our cut rifle stuff. Um, everything's done in house, um, double lapped. Uh, we got some some really nice uh, automated lapping machines that uh, I don't know if you remember the vertical lapping machines that the Germans mm-hmm. had over there when they yeah could, yeah. But uh, ours are horizontal, but. Uh, our president KK Gents and some of the guys that uh, support the uh, the machine maintenance and um, the production side did a great job designing these um, these lapping machines so we can it's all automated now it's not one guy standing there trying to count how many I strokes know, the, the guy at Knight's Armament yeah. who laps all the barrels he he looks yeah. like Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime and this side yeah and his other arm looks like mine <laughs> and they call I think they call him Crab Claw or something because. Like this one arm's huge and his other arm is yeah. normal. Yeah, he's just from like clapping the barrels. Oh and... yeah, that's that's the way all of them started. Gail McMillan back in the day, uh, they had a young guy in there that all his job was he had a leather glove on with like a double pad on it. He'd sit there all day long and just run run laps with those barrels. But uh, that's one of the key factors. That's what makes him go and uh, makes him run hard right out of the gate. But uh, we take a lot of time and and. Um, a lot of kudos to our quality control folks up there. Um, so, w- well, w- let me ask you this. Maybe we'll cut the chase. So, would Proof be as successful without the sister company in Ohio? Like those those doctors, those smart guys, the engineers developing, like, not only the materials, but the processes and what's important no, when, the, when you do the metal replacement? Because no. I got to imagine, like, as the barrel heats up. Yeah. You know, if it's Kevin Brittingham wrapping a barrel, like I wrap a barrel in carbon fiber, but the steel and the carbon fiber and the resin, everything expanding. The generic, the generic process from ABS by wrapping helical, you know, layers over a reduced contour steel liner uh, was pretty primitive, but it was notable enough at the time to make a lightweight hunting rifle that worked. Yeah, um, the guys from Ohio came in and approached it from you know this Uber doing math with letters, uh, engineering <laughs> perspective and, uh, real engineer. Oh yeah. 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 And, um, uh, that's what really identified and, um, secured our IP with, yeah. uh, with, with this, how the materials work and how, uh, the thermal expansion is, is part of our critical, uh, yeah. IP that those guys designed and built, uh, the, the, the final solution into the, the two materials and how they work together. I didn't expect anything. I just thought, okay, this product will do what it's going to do. If they have questions for me, they will ask me. I didn't yeah. go back and peer through the front gate. I didn't call anybody. And uh, I made, you know, because, yeah, I, I made mean, it a point just to really let, let this go. And I believed in it. And if, uh, if, the, if the guys behind me still believe in it, and, um, then it's going to pull through. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it's the right thing, like, yeah. what do you care? You don't care whose barrel they use. Like, you want to do is support your guys. Right. And, you know, and for me, too, like, I'm going to serve you up all these things knowing what you do that could possibly be helpful. Pick the shit out you think's helpful. Like, go use it some. Mm-hmm. Like, don't tell me what you think. Go shoot it and then tell me, you know, what happened and the results and what could be useful. And we'll throw out this shit, and let's work on making this stuff a little better if, if it can make you better at your job. Yeah, and, and, that, and that level of customer, too, where I came from going into proof and, and the opportunities that we anticipated we would, may have going forward um, drove us to make better product. I said, we've got to come up with um, a, a couple different levels of, of thermal capacity with our resin, and we got to make super uber stiff barrels for long range yeah you know with these uh these sniper programs that would have a uh, suppressor deflection poi shift requirements and and uh obviously we make a couple of different variants of barrels and uh, that are uh perform a little bit differently in that in that situation but uh it 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 pushed our engineering group and our management and our leadership and us as a team and as a, as a company um to, to aim as high as we could for the potential we would have yeah. With, uh, with with the with the project that I had sort of uh, seeded, for lack of a better phrase, uh, you know, before I left to go to proof. 
So. Well, I know before you left to go to proof, I knew nothing about them. I was just hearing about them. But, you know, the way I, I knew, view, I knew just a little bit more. And that <laughs> was about it. But the way I perceive it now, it's a company that like I aspire for our company to be like, like, I hope that's the way we're thought of too. like innovation and quality and things that actually make a difference. And it's not just painting carbon fiber, you yeah. know, on a barrel and saying it's cool. Yeah. It's like actually something that makes a difference with the guys. Cause we, you know, we do have some some competitors out there that I would have to say don't do it like we do for lack of being yeah. disrespectful. I don't want to never do talk down a competitor's product, but you're uh, at the wrong place. <laughs> Kevin, doesn't, <laughs> Kevin, doesn't, do no, Kevin you know. doesn't do that either. No, but I see it, you know, like I see it with whether it's Daniel defense with the wannabe honey badgers. Like once you get to a certain level of success, your biggest critics and the haters, they're going to start mimicking and copying you. And they can't ever do it the way you do. If you're basing it in science and engineering like you do in yeah. that experience. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, I know, you know, and I appreciate what you guys do for us. You guys make barrels for us for the fix and customers. And you're putting the muzzle taper on them. And, you know, I just built two guns up. I got barrels from you to um, take to Africa. I go to Africa in a couple of weeks. And I got 16-inch um, you know, these big, heavy proof barrels that weigh two ounces less <laughs> yeah, than my barrels. small diameter, which m our barrels would work great for me. Sure. But I'm really appreciative of those, those proof barrels. Yeah. And that's, yeah. those are what I'm, I've taken a th uh, yeah, 308 and a six, five, and that's what are on my guns. I'm going to go kill stuff. Good stuff. Um, yeah, stuff. I saw you build those up and I was like, man, that's the coolest, the coolest. I know. Barrel. Just, and it and looks I mean, so sexy. It is, man. It's, it's like got lingerie. Yeah. And I mean, we talked about a little. Off air, but like even AR barrels with the doing the carbon wrapped AR barrels and everything, like it's just it's the next thing. It's and it's I, legit. Yeah, well, I, I think it. like the basic level of questions, you know, John, you and I can get in the weeds, and even Jay, but um, you know, we've been in it for so long. But a lot of the the novice users will ask questions, and you know, when they ask me, and it, it's like, oh, should I get a proof barrel? And to me, if you can justify yeah. the expense. And you can find one, you should get it. And now that you guys do 16 inch ones for the fix, because it's 90% of what I use the 16 inch barrel on my right. gun. Like even shooting to four, 500, maybe 600 meters, like I use 16 inch. Mm -hmm. The um, because it's another thing. Oh my God! So so we'll, we'll have to get on the downhill slide here, but you know that I wanted to bring up because you guys are now kind of held to a higher standard because. And I think because of the war effort, we have way better ammo than we had 20 years ago, and we have way better optics. Mm -hmm. And we just have better platforms overall. So you can't, like, your product's got to be real. Like, you can't hide behind it. No, you it. can't hide behind no. anything. I was going to use the same term. And, uh, you know, we're fortunate enough to have had some, some success with various platforms with the Navy and, and various international units and got a lot of T&E effort going on across the board with uh, various other groups. Uh, our good friends down at Fort Bragg are, are uh, coming around. We had to kind of <laughs> we had to kind of rewind their love a little bit. It took they're a while. Stubborn, but uh, anyhow, they're great guys to work with. And, oh yeah. uh, we're gaining some ground there. And I, I mean, if you can stomach working with them, you're going to end up oh, better I, with I, a better product. I have for a long time, and I I I understand how they work. You know. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I've had a love affair with those guys for almost twenty years yeah. now. But yeah. you know, it's like. You know, some of those guys, you know, me coming from a different background, it's it's like a sibling relationship. Like, I want to punch them in the junk half the time. But, <laughs> but they consistently make me better at my job. Make well, they my do. Company they're they're probably the, uh, they're the most deliberate uh, capability development uh, organization within uh, any, any spec or, uh, or I guess, um, tier that you, that you can, you can imagine. Yeah. They're, they're, they're probably, um, yeah, very yeah. deliberate. I like to use that. Yeah, word. I mean they're they're great. Yeah, and, and um, you know they and from a vendor perspective, you know, and you've been on both sides. Like they pull no punches, and they you know they're going to tell you what's up, and um, you know it's not for for the meek or, or the the weak of heart. I yeah. mean you gotta you, you're going to take some punches here and there with those guys. But for me, whether it's your organization or theirs or or some of the others. You know, it's where I wanted to live because, like, I wanted to get better. They'll make and, you better. And, yeah, yeah. And, and you guys did. You can't be thin-skinned if you go if you want to do work with them and yeah. do business with them. Yeah. Well, I can't afford the testing that you provided or they provided, right. and I want to get better. Like, 
you know, when I'm so competitive, the last thing that I actually lost was an 06 to Surefire, and I should have lost. And all it did was make me want to crush them. Yeah. And I was willing to put my money where my mouth was. I was going to put in the work, and I think we did it. Um, well, failure can be motivational, and you you, you, you turned it into that, right? So, yeah. And uh, that's the way it should work. I hope, and you know, we see the success here. Well, how many uh, – you guys build a lot of complete rifles now? We do, man. It's really been coming on. Uh, I don't – I'd be afraid to I quote, love this quote gun. real numbers, but, uh, oh. um, you know, yeah, we have a, a, a very, very aggressive full build um, process uh, in-house right now. Well, what's so. what's the range or the, the, the models? Like you build – because you guys came out with a 22. We did. That's so badass. I yeah. love, oh my God. Like, I hate that in America we think your 22 should cost 300 bucks. You and I both know you yeah. shoot 22 more than anything. Yeah. Like, pay four grand for your 22. Well, this, yeah, this is a premium. It's uh, the action is Zermatt action. This is something that's so uh, big horn, uh, big horn action. Kelly, our, uh, Kelly Strife, our, our sales and marketing gal, she does a great job with uh, strategizing the models and working the market. And, Do you uh, ask her if I can trade some stuff for one of those? She'd be probably glad to help oh, you. Yeah. I love it. But uh, squirrel I can't assassinator even, Jay, I, I can't even keep up with uh, with the newer stuff. I, I, you know, I'm so busy in my rabbit hole. I, I have to reach out yeah. to our, our website every once in a while to <laughs> refresh my memory. I about understand what our product line is. So, will you build small act or short action, long action? Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, th- that, and this is the example of our earlier attack to our our newest version of this is is. Um, I love that gun. Nobody could afford to buy it from me. Yeah. Earlier. I've got one just like it in Creedmoor and Creedmore and exact same stock uh, geometry and 300 wind mag. The, personal gun. This gun with, um, so our friend Lindsay, who was head of your cousin yeah. unit CDD and also uh, biggest adversary in some ways when it comes to product development. Um, he can shoot. Yeah. One of the best shooters in the world. Yeah. He was the first person to shoot this gun when I got it. And um, with the uh, what's the three hundred eight like the the match ammo they got the one eighteen what what's it called what's the three hundred eight twenty eighteen milli good military ammo that's accurate oh the the uh, M one one eight LR yeah one one eight one hundred seventy five grain match game yeah he shot a ten shot group that was under half inch with this very yeah, nice very first group we shot out of this gun that's he's good. like that's good news. You should keep that gun. You know, it feels great. His stoic way. When Robbie and uh, I forget who was with him, they came to visit still at Remington. He bought a rifle and uh, he says, uh, Robbie Johnson, who was at the AMU and and Remington Defense, and I got at SIG and we started Q together. He's He's one of the best shooters in the entire world. You betcha. And and that was a testament to what uh, Proof could do and was doing at the time. If Robbie Johnson buys a rifle from you, unless he's got it sold already, yeah. Your stuff shoots. Yeah, yeah. yeah I great. mean, and, and to put it in perspective for those watching or listening, he was the first human being. And I don't know if you know this. So, what is that? Trucks. So, um, <laughs> UFOs. T- to shoot an M16 20 inch barrel iron sights, an AMU gun, but still a thousand yards, 20 shots inside of 10 inches. Man. Iron sights. That's a shooter. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah, the most incredible feat in the history of the shooting world. And the very next year, one of his teammates broke his record. <laughs> Is that right? Well, yeah. It's a true story. Well, but uh, yeah, if they he shoots your gun now. and buys one, yeah, it shoots. Yeah. We were proud to, to have uh, to have him say good things about uh, the rifle he bought from us. So that was even better. Yeah. So you're doing that. You're doing barrels. You guys are doing barrels for a lot of new guns. Yeah. We got a big, uh, one of our biggest uh, OEM customers is savage they've got a commercial release with uh with their little 110 version i don't remember the name of the actual rifle but it's very popular and affordable but they use our barrels and uh and um uh we've got a plethora of other uh i don't know if it was but uh, if it was tika or um you got the 22s coming now you do 1022 barrels we do ar barrels Mm-hmm. SR25 barrels or AR10s, whatever they're called. Yeah, we do drop in AIs, we do drop in MRADs, we do um, the MRAD that uh, drop in gun. drop in fixed barrels. We uh, oh, we try to you know cover all the bases and add something new or uh, every year. So, yeah. but the key to the success and the growth and I think what I feel I've seen and and what we're experiencing now is just getting all the right people in the right place because 
Bill, yeah, we, you I mean, you your know. company's your people. It's the biggest aggravation, but it's the biggest asset. And there's been some turnover, you know, but uh, we've got a, a great team of folks that um, all believe in the same thing. And that's uh, that's what it takes. You yeah, know. you got a good leader that can express and um, yeah. you, you know what the goal is and inspire people yeah. to ha- have a passion to chase it. You mm-hmm. you, you can get somewhere. Yeah. I mean, I see it. I mean, I see it with you know engineering. I mean, Ethan ran out of here and like his dudes are working on some stuff for us right now. I was surprised he only showed up because you were here, but um, <laughs> but you know, like I can't pay those guys enough to work at ten o'clock at night, right? Just can't. Yeah, it, it's like true. you got to provide the opportunity and the inspiration and, and the things that they can work on where they're inspired to do that. Exactly. Um, all right. Well, I'm excited about what you're doing at Proof. So before we close up, let, let's let's talk about a couple things. MP7, you're at command. Mm. What can you say about the MP7? Oh, Other well. than what I know is it's one either the most or second most reliable machine gun HKs ever produced. It and the G36, one, but it's very similar, but. Right. It, um, you know, the 4.6 by 30 cartridge, you know, you see those little guys, yeah, Jay? little bee stingers yeah. there. Um, little babies. you know, it was, it was an opportunity for us to, you know, change and improve the capability of an MP5, uh, from a nine millimeter pistol round capability at short range and, you know, limited penetration, um, heavy gun, you know, legacy. Okay. I mean, HK was a lot of the reputation was built around, you know, the G3 and the MP5, you know, yeah. the first thing, two guns that come to mind, right? Yeah. So um, this was new, and uh, we, we had a, you know, our, our, our programs had had uh, had space to upgrade and increase and modernize from, from some, some legacy stuff, and this was an obvious choice back in the day, and, uh, you know. Well, what's what's the idea? Well, wait, for, for those that don't know, the G3, so Tommy, let's throw it up on the screen. It's the HK battle rifle when they were all 308. And I think it's the third most prolific gun produced in the world for like a battle rifle for militaries. And that could be bullshit, but I think it's right. Yeah, it's like that in the I FAL. I think it's the, the AK, the FAL, and then the G3. Yeah, the G3 started at set me in Spain. And yeah, tra- so roller, to... roller delayed opening, so yeah. roller lock gun. Yeah. Um, but cool gun. Yeah, that's what you think of. So this comes in. So so what role does this fill? Like what's that gun for? You know, it was, it was a close in you know low vis um you know pds type of thing where you could conceal it it would shoot fast it would it was super reliable at pretty good capacity um, yeah the, the, what is it that's a 40 round mag I 40 think. round one, yeah 40. and the one that's in it's 20 and it's flush so because yeah. I, I think you guys probably used to cut those vertical grips off and put a rail in there or something so one of the groups did i think isn't it the the navy version is with the thir- 1913 on the bottom instead of that it is folding that, that, okay. changed, that changed after the first few we did for yeah the, uh, for the uh but i mean that's the, not the much bigger than a pistol but you got full yeah. auto capability that's reliable and you got a 40 round mag and a 20 that's flush you can stick that under your arm and i think as i can remember the penetration capability of even though it's a small 36 to a 40 grain projectile moving pretty fast would would penetrate you know christ that armor yeah, and that's well, what, that's what they designed it for. It's fast and pointy. It was designed at the same time the P90 was from FN when that whole PDW yeah, program. Yeah, that back whole in, NATO thing about yeah. penetrating helmets. Yeah, or whatever. And, and this yeah. was a residual from that that development effort back in those days, and it seemed like uh, um, an obvious candidate to to replace the MP5 for us. And uh, the guys the guys took it and used it quite a bit. Um, it took a couple of instances, I would say, to understand its limits you know yeah um it's it's not a, a 416 and yeah. it's not an ak-47 but oh. you know if you're going in the right place and you need something that this will do then this is obviously the right tool for it so that's what i, I i've been like trying to explain to people it, 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 at the it, time it was at the time it, well yeah. i mean i even think i think now i mean i think we could do something better with the honey badger but what i would say with this the gun's so compact you know and we had a silencer on other things to get it bigger but I don't ever want to have to engage someone with my sidearm with a pistol. Mm-hmm. This is not much bigger, and I've got capacity. I have full auto. It's shoulder fired. I can be very accurate yeah. with it. Um, you know, I mean, as you know, that little bullet. There's no recoil. There's no muzzle climb. The gun signature wise is very, very quiet. I mean, we did the silencers for all these. Well, it's easier easier 
super easy to control high rate of fire you know shot placement becomes a little more critical when you've got such low mass projectiles on target so it you had to be better with it and keep it you know um yeah uh, there, there, there's a place but yeah it's not yeah. primary yeah. yeah like one one of the one of the uh oh i sees down at green years ago he was a big huge man six foot eight i think was the biggest man ever in, in special forces but uh <laughs> He was their commanding officer at the time we were going through a review and it's like all the uh all of the acquisition assessment directors down at socom were like well why do you need so many guns why do you need so many guns and it's like well doesn't the average pro golfer have 14 clubs in his bag and i was like wow i've never forgotten that that was 20 years ago i heard that yeah, but, but it, it does put it in perspective yeah. because i think you know it's interesting to me working with special operations for a couple decades daily and that, you know, there's the guys like me and you doing support that we're only doing support because we, we love that and we want to support them. But, you know, you automatically think, oh, my God, the guys rely on this to save their life. Well, they also rely on all their other equipment. Right. But half the guys love guns. Half of them don't give a shit. It's just a tool. It's no different than their boots well, there are, or anything you know, we, else. We call it, you know, some guys are the gun shoot gun good guys. And then you have some that are really into you know, and it's not just their gun. They're passionate about everything they do. And it's, yeah. just, I, I, I'm not trying to criticize or, you know, no, I mean, it takes personalities it takes a whole here, team. but it's just, you know, people are different with different things. And, uh, you know, we, we, we saw that there and that, then that's evident everywhere. Isn't it? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think so. But as I learned more and you, you learn about, as we work with the guys, you learn about engagement and, you know, the operate, like the things that they're doing, which are necessary for you to do your job, me do my job. It's like, don't tell me what you, what gun and all you need. Tell me what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Give, like, me, the, give me the target. Yeah. yeah and, and then like, let us help you to think of the best thing and then give it a shot, you yeah. know, so to speak. But yeah, seeing a little sub gun, a little PDW and like, I understand the need for, you know, a pistol sidearm, although, you know, it's very rare. That that's something that she used, but you know, you need something for in this room, you need something out to 200 meters mm -hmm. or whatever you decide. You need something out to, to four or 500 meters. You need a thousand meter. Yeah. Y you're right. I mean, you, you end up with me trying to keep stuff even very simple and clean. It's like, there's four or five guns you got to have. Right. If, if you're expected to engage targets at this distance and in, in these scenarios. Um, so yeah, it takes everything starting from here, going to there, coming here. Yeah. Um, right tool uh, for the job, you know? Yeah, that, that's right. Well, um, Man, it's been great. Jay, you think of more stuff? What do you? I mean, you got really, some questions? Not really even questions, but I just I think it'll be it'll come across extremely clear just from this. But like, even talking, I mean, I just met you today, so even talking off the the podcast, and like I know Kevin, um, and I think when initially when people hear like, oh, he worked with with this group or with this unit or whatever. Um, especially now we've kind of talked about it in the gun industry or whatever, that there's a lot of flexing going on and like both of you, you especially, but Kevin too, like there's, you guys have worked with some of the most elite dudes in the world, like the top tier worldwide. Um, Oh, the most elite guys in the history of the world. Right. Not and, even just current. And just has only been nothing but nice things about them and just very, there's no flexing. It's all very humble. And I think, I think that's super important. I think it's cool for people to see that. Uh, especially in the culture of I did this, you didn't do this. I have this, you don't have this. And mm. I, I think it's really cool. So uh, I got the coolest yeah. job in the world. I get to meet all you guys. <laughs> and talk to all you guys so. uh, thanks for the kind words. But yeah, I mean, it was, just, it was pure passion and honor for me. And I got to close with that. Mm -hmm.